from the top rope, and the great American bash, I bid you all good evening, morning, afternoon, wherever you may be in this great land of ours or around the world. Welcome to the $55 million studio on the Pro Wrestle Machine. Let's get into this issue. Through the use of the Pro Wrestle Machine, December 14, 1998 Wrestling Observer Newsletter. Two biographies in the works about Jesse Ventura by Observer Staff. The latest round of mainstream media stories this week were the Steve Austin story in Rolling Stone, the Bill Goldberg feature in People and news of two different networks doing movies and an autobiography book planned on the life of Jesse Ventura. Both ABC News and NBC are planning to produce made-for-TV biographies on Ventura. The ABC News documentary, which will air on December 30th on the A&E Network, has been filming in recent weeks with interviews with many people both in and out of the pro wrestling industry. Among those interviewed this past week have included Hulk Hogan, Greg Gagne, Bob Geigel, who was the first promoter to book Ventura in the old Kansas City circuit back in 1975, a friend and his commander in his Navy SEALs days, and myself. For whatever reason, the WWF will be not be cooperating with this movie. Perhaps they feel it will be competition for their own planned video release on December 15th of a Best of Ventura WWF tape. It should be noted that Ventura in a TV news report on WCCO in Minneapolis mentioned they didn't tell him ahead of time about doing the tape although he wasn't complaining about more royalties coming in from it, and that they were six months behind in paying him his tape royalties. On recent releases of old footage such as the Best of Survivor series tapes, the original announcing by Ventura in the old matches was voiced over in studio by the current announcer so the company wouldn't have to pay royalties to Ventura. Because of all that, whatever pro wrestling footage that would air would likely be from WCW as an announcer, and possibly the AWA as a wrestler, unless Don Owen has any 70s tapes still laying around. The Hollywood Reporter on December 4th quoted NBC insiders as saying that NBC West Coast President Don Olmeyer and Entertainment President Scott Sassa, whose name may be familiar to pro wrestling fans as back about six years ago Sassa was one of the major TBS executives who voted to fold the wrestling operation due to millions of dollars in annual losses and declining television ratings, only to have Ted Turner himself veto the idea, came up with the idea after Ventura's appearance on The Tonight Show on November 17 drew a 6.2 rating and 16 share nationally and a 30.5 rating and 60 share in the Minneapolis-St. Paul market, the best numbers that show has done on a Tuesday night during sweeps in two years. The movie has not even started production. Ventura sold a book deal with Valar Imprint of Random House for what has been reported to be a $500,000 deal, in a bidding war over at least seven different major publishers. Ventura had a 20-page proposal shopped around for a planned book which would discuss his past as a Navy SEAL, a pro wrestler and in acting along with his political viewpoints. The proposed title of the autobiography would be I Ain't Got Time to Bleed, Reworking the Body Politic from the Bottom Up. The book is scheduled to have a mid-April deadline for summer distribution. The Austin story in the December 24th to January 7th issue of Rolling Stone was a must-read, perhaps the best story of all in this recent mainstream media blitz. It was far more in-depth than most of the recent wrestling is really popular and the WWF is really sleazy stories. The story by Chris Heath gives a very fair portrayal of Austin and the wrestling industry. Austin comes off as a real person who got his spot through a weird combination of fate and being in the right place at the right time with the right gimmick in an industry so filled with lies that after being around it for a few weeks, you start thinking everything is a lie. It opened talking about Austin on a day off going to a shooting range, drinking Coors Light while driving while listening to heavy metal, and shooting, drinking and talking noting that more young men will watch his matches on Monday night than watch Monday night football. It said media exposes in the 80s of it being fake were nothing that any half-conscious fan over 14 didn't know for themselves, saying it was enjoyed by its audience not as actual battle, but as kind of a vicious cooperation with hyped-up storylines. It blamed the fall in the 90s to stale storylines and presentations and the investigation, indictment and eventual trial of Vince McMahon and the time, money and energy it sapped from him and his company. The story said that there are 12 hours of wrestling on television each week in the United States, actually 22 January 2nd hours in most markets, 15 January 2nd hours of which are carried nationally on networks with major national penetration, and that's not including small local independent TV shows in some markets, listed WCW as a $200 million per year company, which is probably not a large exaggeration, and WWF is claiming to be a $500 million per year company, which is. There is some info that wasn't in other mainstream articles on Austin, such as his birth name being Steven Anderson, but his biological father disappeared early and he went by the surname of his stepfather. He started watching Houston wrestling as a fifth grader. He was very popular in high school, 
including being voted Mr. Cowboy, equivalent to Homecoming King, at Edna High in 1983, being a good enough football player to get him to North Texas State University in Denton, Texas, ironically, the same college that Kevin and David Von Erich, who Austin had watched on TV wrestling for years, had attended years earlier. His former football coach, who remembered him as a clean-cut kid with great manners, noted that at his alma mater, where he is like a hero, that they often have to send kids home from school if they come wearing some of Austin's most offensive t-shirts. It talked about his start in wrestling with the USWA, and having his name changed from Steve Williams to Steve Austin because of Dr. Death, already having a big name in pro wrestling, and of his $20 to $40 payoffs working Tennessee before getting a $75,000 per year contract with WCW, which was increased to $156,000 his second year in. It talked about Eric Bischoff firing him because of the his time spent on the injured list, and the belief they couldn't market him. Austin in other publications has attributed his belief he was fired as a decision actually made by Hulk Hogan. It talked briefly about his going to ECW before WWF called, and went on at length about his stint as the ringmaster, it sucked, in WWF. Austin said he got the idea for his current character watching an HBO film about serial killers. The serial killer in the movie was named Iceman, and Austin told the WWF about it, and they faxed him back three pages of names. I actually remember this story being some major comedy about three years back in the dressing room and apparently he still gets teased, about the lame names WWF, which thought Iceman had to do with temperature, and not attitude, came up with before his wife Jeannie came up with Stone Cold. It talked of the first time Austin gave the finger as for the traditionalists and wrestling's more sensitive viewers, it marked another sad step into the gutter. For the fans and the money men, it was the moment when pro wrestling found its spirit and belatedly muscled its way into the it's all good trash talking 90s. I also talked of last year's SummerSlam when he was injured by Owen Hart. It noted he hasn't forgiven Hart for the accident, which is why the feud was never played out upon his return. He has always been bitter about Hart's actions, and it was noted that nobody told him ahead of time when they did the Hart-Dan Severn angle playing off his reality. Austin said that angle in a way was a slap in the face, but he recognizes that nothing is sacred in wrestling. On one hand, you would think maybe they would think a little bit more about how you feel about it before they do it. But on the other hand it's a business where they try to take advantage of a lot of things you wouldn't expect them to take advantage of, and this just happens to be one of those instances. McMahon's comments on the angle with Severn was, if something like that is an opportunity for us to capitalize on it, we will unabashedly capitalize on it. I don't believe any subject matter is sacred. It is the American way. Austin talked openly on how wrestling matches are worked and put together, and it was noted that half the people in the country still have no idea who he is, but he's worshipped by the millions that do. It says his favorite part of his performance is when his ring entrance music hits, and the pop when he hits the stunner for the finish. The story noted that McMahon and Austin have a great working relationship, altogether different than the portrayals of their respective television personas, and McMahon claimed to have a clear idea of the next five years' worth of Austin's storylines. Heath's comment on the recent angle where Austin took McMahon hostage was to say you get the feeling that you are observing something truly pioneering and groundbreaking, albeit in a marvelously ghastly way something recklessly out of control. The author admitted being around the world of lies made him question everything and become paranoid. The author admitted wondering whether WWF and WCW are really in cahoots, but then said that he didn't think so, but if they were then the people in charge were both terrific and cruel actors. He even worried as to whether Austin was really hurt by heart, but said he thought he was, because of the reactions of his wife, who he said didn't seem like a double bluffing type. His reactions were interesting because they are the sign of the exact point of when being around wrestling too much warps people's realities. The exact point is when you start believing WWF and WCW are in cahoots and it's all an angle or when you start thinking the things that obviously are not angles are angles. It's the same point those who have been in the business too long who believe that most every big money boxing match and most every NFL football game actually has the outcomes arranged ahead of time, not that occasional fixing in those sports probably hasn't gone on. Too long in wrestling does make some people believe everything in the world is like wrestling, and the reality is that very little else really is, at least to that degree. You can turn your brain off when reading the December 14th People magazine story on Goldberg, ironically enough, called Ringmaster. And they say Goldberg isn't a copy of Austin, actually I don't believe he is at all even with the similar looks, although he may not think so now that his incredible momentum has slowed down, since he's been known in angles to ask people what would Austin do in this situation, but it's certainly a debatable point. Austin's portrayal had a lot of depth, 
depicting a multidimensional person who understands the excesses of the business and appears to be one of the few who made it huge but unlike people like Hogan, Dusty Rhodes, Antonio Inoki, etc. who also made it huge in their day, hasn't lost his perspective over who he really is because of it. This Goldberg piece was shallow about a guy who is nice to his cat, signs autographs for kids and makes time to visit seriously ill children, all of which is actually true. The story doesn't tell much about Goldberg that isn't already widely known. His Jewish heritage, his father being an obstetrician and mother a purveyor of arts, ironically very similar to Ric Flair's parents aside from the religion, and his college and NFL football career. Unlike Heath, who seemed to learn what pro wrestling was about only too well, author Bruce Frankel barely scratched the surface, as noted by these two sentences, Goldberg's spring popularity underscores pro wrestling's successful effort to broaden its audience. In addition to Goldberg, the first Jewish champion wrestler in memory, minority wrestlers including Eddie Guerrero, who is Hispanic, and Booker T, an African American, have been scripted into the role of good guy winners. As if ethnic babyfaces are something newly created in the business. As if the author clearly had any clue as to Guerrero's role. In the silly stat of the week, the story claimed Nitro is viewed by 7.2 million viewers each week, actual average is 4.5 million, making it among the most watched TV shows in the country. Even though the Monday night pro wrestling shows dominate cable ratings, their respective audiences would be pathetic by network standards so calling them among the most watched TV shows in the country couldn't be more wrong. The rerun of the NBC Secret Special on November 21st drew more viewers than any episode of Raw or Nitro in history, and more viewers actually than Raw and Nitro combined were doing as recently as 15 months ago. And it was one of the five lowest rated shows of that week on the original three major networks. In the overall ratings, the audience of Nitro and Raw would be around number 125 for the week if it was listed in the network ratings, so all this popularity, while impressive, has to be put in its proper perspective. As would be expected, even though the Austin story was controversial as exposing WWF storylines and characters, the WWF played the story up big on its broadcast. And as would be expected from a company that appears to be totally asleep at the wheel, WCW never once mentioned the Goldberg story, just as it didn't acknowledge Goldberg's TV Guide cover the week before and with the exception of a brief remark by Gene Okerlund so quick that almost nobody caught it, has yet to even mention the Bret Hart movie. All Japan and New Japan finished their seasons as far as major shows go this past week with the finals of each company's respective tag team tournaments and building to major early 1999 shows. As was the plan all along, Kenta Kobashi and Jun Akiyama captured the 22nd annual Real World Tag League Tournament on December 5 at Tokyo Nihon Budokan Hall before 16,300 fans, sold out weeks in advance, beating Vader and Stan Hansen, who had gone unbeaten in the round-robin portion of the tournament. The match, which aired the next night on a 45-minute expanded television show, saw Vader and Hansen, the new superpower combination, dominate early. The storyline they seem to be working is that for the first 10 minutes, no time can stop the power of the two biggest foreign stars in Japan of the last 10 years, but after 10 minutes, it becomes competitive. Kobashi was first taken out being posted by Hansen. Then Akiyama was clotheslined on the floor by Vader and DDT'd on the floor by Hansen, knocking him out. Kobashi worked the next several minutes with the two-on-one. Vader finally delivered his Vader bomb, and the two did a double-team stuff power bomb on Kobashi. Hansen raised his arm to signal for the lariat, but just at that moment, Akiyama awoke and behind Hansen's back, climbed to the top rope. Akiyama came off with either a high knee or a flying elbow, we've heard different versions, which stunned Hansen, allowing Kobashi to hit a desperation lariat for the pin in 1903. It was said to have been a very good match, although not of the caliber of the tag team tournament finals of the past several years which all were in the five-star range. New Japan went with a new combination of Keiji Muto and Satoshi Kojima in its super-grade tag team tournament, winning a four-team single elimination tournament on December 6 in Nagoya Aichi Ken Gym before a sellout 9,500 fans beat Tatsumi Fujinami and Shinya Hashimoto in the finals when Kojima was given his biggest profile career win to date as he pinned legendary Fujinami clean in the middle after three clotheslines in 1851. After several weeks of postponing announcements since the company was having a hard time coming up with a show, New Japan finally held its press conference on December 13 to announce the lineup for the January 4, 1999 Wrestling World in Tokyo Dome but even as late as the afternoon of the press conference positions were being jockeyed and matches were being changed, and the top three matches still have not been officially announced. They are going with a best of three New Japan vs UFO series as the headline, which is terribly premature. 
New Japan had hoped to build the show around Keiji Muto vs Masahiro Chono in an NWO split singles match and the debut of Goldberg, but neither wound up happening. The three matches will be Yuji Nagata vs Dave Benito, a former UFC fighter now training for pro wrestling, Brian Johnston, who will be representing New Japan, against Don Fry, and the main event will be Shinya Hashimoto vs Naoya Ogawa. Originally Kazuo Yamazaki was going to be part of the New Japan team, but he blew out his knee in the tag team tournament and will be out of action past the Dome Show. Hashimoto vs Ogawa will be the rubber match between the two since they met twice in 1997 at Dome Shows, with Ogawa winning over the then IWGP champ in a non-title match in his pro debut at the Tokyo Dome, a shock result needed when New Japan's plans of building the top of its Dome Shows around Ken Shamrock fell through when Shamrock signed with WWF which didn't draw well, but Ogawa's win led to a sellout at the first ever event at the Osaka Dome a few weeks later, where Hashimoto retained the title, for 53,000 fans. Fry vs. Johnston was set up in an angle where the tag team partners split up on December 4 in Osaka during a match where Fry beat Nagata. The IWGP heavyweight title match was literally changed at the last minute. The plan as late as this weekend was for Scott Norton to have a title vs. title match against J1 heavyweight champion, Rikidos and Belt, Tenryu, However with Muto not being part of the major program, he strongly politic to get himself in the title match. Muto is also doing an angle that he's forming his own NWO, having nothing to do with the American branch or the Japanese Chono branch. Muto's self-serving storyline is that when Hulk Hogan ran the NWO, that was okay since Hogan was a superstar in the business when Muto was just starting out. But he wasn't going to be part of a group run by Scott Steiner, who he sees as a wrestler of his same age that he doesn't see as nearly the level of a star in the business as himself. This freed up Tenryu and Koshinaka to defend the IWGP tag titles against Satoshi Kojima and Hiroyoshi Tenzan, the two longtime rivals who are together representing NWO. Jushin Liger defends the IWGP junior heavyweight title against Koji Kanemoto. Tatsuhiro Takaiwa and Shinjiro Otani defend the IWGP junior tag titles against Dr. Wagner Jr. and Kendo Kashin. The previously announced Atsushi Onita vs. Kensuke Sasaki match, which it is expected will end up being changed to a street fight stipulation match, the Tokyo Dome and New Japan won't allow an explosive barbed wire match or use of fire in the building, however Onita is going to be able to bring items like the barbed wire baseball bat as a foreign object to the ring in the street fight match. There are people within the Japanese industry really scared of this one because they don't see how the two can work together as Sasaki isn't good at carrying people and Onita is physically shot. To show New Japan's concern for the match, even though Onita working the New Japan Dome show should be a major mainstream ticket seller because of Onita's name value as a celebrity, it is positioned as the third match on a 10-match show so if it's a disaster, it'll long be forgotten after the two junior matches that are almost guaranteed winners. In magazine interviews hyping the match, Sasaki actually blamed Onita for pro wrestling's recent decline in popularity in Japan. Sasaki claimed that Onita's non-athletic gimmick-style matches got a lot of mainstream press and caused people to think that pro wrestling itself was easy and nothing but a gimmick show and lowered the public's respect for wrestlers as athletes, hence causing a decline in the popularity of it as a sport. Filling out the show is a New Japan vs. Heisei Ishgun six-man with Tadao Yasuda and Osamu Kido and Fujinami vs. Mishiyoshi Ohara and Tatsutoshi Goto and Kengo Kimura, and the opener sends former national amateur champions Nakanishi against Kazuyuki Fujita. In the All Japan Tournament, Vader and Hansen finished the round robin with a 7-0 record and clinched going to the finals of the sold-out show one week in advance. Kobashi and Akiyama went into the final week having to beat current PWF and international tag team champs Toshiaki Kawada and Akira Tawe, going for the three-peat after tournament wins in 1996 and 1997 on December 2, Takawamori and Yoshihiro Takayama on December 3, and Johnny Ace and Bart Gunn on December 4. Kobashi and Akiyama beat Kawada and Tawe in 21:40 in Matsumoto when Akiyama pinned Tawe with an exploder suplex in what was said to have been a great match tape for Samurai TV. In the expected win, they beat Amori and Takayama on December 3rd in Shizuoka. This put Kobashi and Akiyama vs Gun and Ace in the December 4th match in Chiba. If Ace and Gun won, they would have to face Kawada and Tawe in a playoff match earlier in the Budokan Hall for the right to meet Hansen and Vader. If it was a 30 minutes draw then Kawada and Tawe would go to the finals. If Kobashi and Akiyama won, they would go to the finals. It ended in 2004 when Kobashi pinned Gun after a lariat. Behind Kobashi and Akiyama, who went 5-1-1 and in the round-robin aspect, and Vader and Hansen at first and second place, the remainder of the tournament standings were. 3. 
Kawada and Tawei 5 and 2. 4. Ace and Gun 4 and 3. 5. Mitsuharu Masawa and Yoshinari Ogawa 3 3 and 1. 5. Headhunters 1 and 6, Takayama and Amori 1 and 6 and Gary Albright and Giant Kimala 2 1 and 6. After the Budokan show, promoter Giant Baba said that Vader, who was being given credit for largely turning around the promotion and giving it some major momentum, was now the number one contender for Misawa's Triple Crown, and that with the tag tourney win, that Kobashi and Akiyama are the top contenders for Kawada and Tawei double tag belts. The January tour, traditionally a breaking in tour in which Hansen isn't even booked, although both Vader and Gunn are back, will feature the first ever singles meeting of Vader vs. Kobashi on January 15th at Yokohama Bunka Gym, which is expected to determine who faces the Triple Crown champ on March 6th at Budokan Hall. Baba has turned all the booking over to Misawa with the exception of booking the matches and the end result of the Triple Crown title matches. Misawa will make his first title defense on January 22nd at Osaka Furitsu Gym against Kawada, the first singles rematch of the two since their May 1st match at the Tokyo Dome where Kawada beat Misawa for the title. All Japan, which along with EMLL is the most traditional company left in the business, in a business where these days being traditional is usually not the right avenue, has usually had long classic matches including sometimes going 60 minutes, in the first Triple Crown match of the season which is usually held in Osaka. It's expected the first Budokan will end up as Misawa vs. Vader and Kawada and Tawei vs. Kobashi and Akiyama. As expected going in the general feeling coming out of the tournament is things are turning around due to the momentum caused by signing Vader. On this tour crowds were up across the board, but Baba afterwards felt that the crowds outside the Tokyo area were still below par but he was happy with the Tokyo area business. There is a lot of speculation as to an attempt at a relationship with the WWF since Baba is going to Vancouver on December 13th with Ace for a vacation, which not so coincidentally, is the site of this week's WWF pay-per-view show. Although many have spoken of both Vader and Guns appearing as signs of a relationship between the two companies, Vader actually quit WWF and made his own deal with All Japan for 20 weeks at approximately $12,000 per week. Gun wasn't being booked by WWF, as they were wanting to reintroduce him with a new gimmick, and Ace booked him into Japan as his new tag team partner. WWF simply didn't block the booking but it wasn't a deal done through WWF and BABA. WWF, which is pretty hot in Japan among the hardcores since Raw is on the satellite in Japan and at least for hardcore wrestling fans, satellite dishes are becoming somewhat common, Nitro is also on but it isn't as hot in Japan, has gotten feelers from both FMW for sending talent to two pay-per-view shows next year, and even backdoor messages from New Japan since its own relationship with WCW have been strained at times and WCW really hasn't much in the way of top talent, in the last several months. The feeling coming out of this tour is that if a deal could be put together where a few underneath WWF performers that aren't being booked strong could come in as mid-card guys and freshen the stale mix. New Japan ended its round-robin aspect of its tournament on December 5th, with a four-way tie, not so coincidentally enough, with IWGP tag champs Tenryu and Koshinaka, Fujinami and Hashimoto, Muto and Kojima, and Sasaki and Yamazaki all finishing with four and two records. The four-way tie was put together on the final two nights of the tour. On December 4th in Osaka which drew a sellout 6,500 fans for a show which included two key tournament matches, an IWGP heavyweight and junior heavyweight title match and an appearance by Don Fry saw Fujinami and Hashimoto beating Tenryu and Koshinaka and Muto and Kojima beating Yamazaki and Sasaki. This left one tournament match for December 5th in Tokushima, with Tenryu and Koshinaka vs Nagata and Nakanishi both going in with three and two records in which the winning team would join Fujinami's team, Muto's team and Sasaki's team in a final four in Nagoya, which ended with Koshinaka pinning Nakanishi. In Nagoya, Muto and Kojima beat Koshinaka and Tenryu in 1321 when Muto pinned Koshinaka with a Frankensteiner and Fujinami and Hashimoto beat Yamazaki and Sasaki in 1745 when Fujinami made Yamazaki submit to a knee lock, which avenged Fujinami submitting to Yamazaki earlier this year not only in this tournament but also in the G1 singles tournament in August, to set up Fujinami losing in the finals. Overall the final standings coming out of the tournament with Muto and Kojima in first, Fujinami and Hashimoto second, Yamazaki and Sasaki and Koshinaka and Tenryu tied for third, Nagata and Nakanishi took fifth with a 3 and 3 record, Hiroyoshi Tenzan and NWO Sting took sixth with a 2 and 4 mark, and the final spot was the WCW team of David Finley and Jerry Flynn going 0 and 6. It has been two more weeks of almost complete obliteration for the WWF in the Monday Night Ratings Wars, making it six weeks in a row with no end in sight. Over the past two weeks, 
Nitro captured only one head-to-head quarter hour on November 30th, and Raw got the clean sweep on December 7th for the much-talked-about taped episode featuring the crucifixion of Steve Austin. For November 30th, the final tally was Raw doing a 5.00 rating, 4.79 first hour, 5.22 seconds hour, and 7.45 share to Nitro's 4.25 rating, 4.97 first hour, 3.84 seconds hour, 3.96 3.96 third hour, and 6.23 share. Over the head-to-head two hours, Raw did a 4.95, the unopposed overrun up the overall mark to 5.00, to Nitro's 3.90. The margin grew on December 7th, despite Nitro coming from the Astrodome in Houston before the second largest crowd and gate in company history. While it visually looked like Austin was put on a cross and tied with his hands outstretched while being raised to the ceiling, WWF somewhat played it down by never using the words cross or crucifixion. The cross was shaped with a T, like a cross, but also a U under the T, so he was being tied up on an Undertaker symbol as explained by horse announcer Michael Cole. Nevertheless, earlier in the show they burned it and there was no question they were trying to do a crucifixion angle without saying the words. It was a lot more elaborate than the AAA version of the angle which aired just seven days earlier on the Lucha Lunes show, in which the cross heavy metal was laid on actually fell apart and the band of Viper Heels had to physically carry him from the ring area to the top row of the bleachers. WCW with 32,076 fans in attendance, the third largest crowd in the all-time record gate for pro wrestling in the state of Texas, which turned out to be 31,460 paying $755,995 and another $257,339 in merchandise put on an unforgivably bad show in front of a crowd that large. The show ended with the audience pelting the ring in disgust as three of the final four matches that got into the ring never took place, including both hyped main events, a Scott Steiner vs. Scott Hall match where the bell never even rang before the NWO run-in finish, and a main event hype for three hours between Bill Goldberg and Bam Bam Bigelow with Kevin Nash getting involved which saw the bell never ring again and security pull the three apart after only 40 seconds of brawling with the show ending on the hour when fans expect six more minutes of action. The crowd trailed only the July 6th Georgia Dome figure of 41,412 in the building and 35,514 paying $906,330 when it comes to WCW company records. It would also be the second largest figures of 1998 for live attendance, and third for live gate and merchandise, trailing only the WrestleMania from the Fleet Center and the Georgia Dome shows in both categories. When it comes to all-time records for the state of Texas, the live attendance and paid attendance trailed the 1997 Royal Rumble at the Alamo Dome in San Antonio with Shawn Michaels vs. Sit on Top which drew 60,525 in the building, and 48,014 paid. However, that show was filled with discount tickets so the gate was $480,013. So this show broke the all-time state gate record by nearly $276,000, the even more famous May 6, 1984 Texas Stadium show with Ric Flair vs. Kerry Von Erich drew 32123 paying $402,000. And even though in many ways it appears WCW is on the downward spiral, these figures will be broken on December 21st when Nitro is at the TWA Dome which has an $872,000 advance, 27,000 tickets with 6,000 tickets remaining at the outlet so it has a very good chance to become the first $1 million house in company history and first ever in the U.S. for a show not promoted by the WWF. And January 4th at the Georgia Dome which already has a $706,000 advance, 22,300 tickets with 12,300 tickets remaining at the outlets. WCW remains consistent in its ability to draw fans to shows, but not to satisfy them when they get there. And even with fans watching the first hour and seeing the huge crowd, which should be a lure to stay, a combination of the recent flaws of WCW and the recent heat of WWF caused the ratings gap to actually grow. For the night, Raw did a 5.14 rating, 5.05 first hour, 5.22 seconds hour, and 7.6 share. Nitro did a 4.16 rating, 4.77 first hour, 3.82 seconds hour, 3.88 third hour, and a 6.1 share. Over the head-to-head two hours, since again Raw went on a post for five minutes at the end, it was Raw at 5.07 and Nitro at 3.85. On November 30th, Raw peaked with a 5.70 rating for both the Bossman vs. Mankind ladder match and Gill vs. Marrow match, to Nitro's anemic 3.2 for the Booker T vs. Mike Enos match that went head up. 
WCW's only quarter-hour win of the past two weeks was a close one, doing a 4.66 for the reuniting of the Outsiders as they faced Horace Hogan and Scott Steiner, while Raw opposed with ratings killers Val Venus vs. Tiger Ali Singh and still managed a 4.62. Probably the biggest stories of the quarter hours on December 7th was that the highlight of the show, the Ric Flair interview, saw the rating actually fall from a 4.3 to a 3.9 marking only the second time in 1998 that a quarter-hour featuring Flair had a ratings drop. For no reasons other than what Raw presented against it, an Austin Taker interview segment and a Blackman vs. Singh match, Nitro's high mark was a 4.3 for Giant vs. Renegade and the non-match with Malenko and Benoit vs. Canyon to the Raw 4.7. Flair's segment not drawing can't be blamed on what Raw presented, since it was Henry vs. Draws, which is not a good sign when even the lone consistent ratings draw the company has left in what is supposed to be his hottest program of the year is left flat. In the final two quarters, Raw dominated as X-Pac and Triple H vs. Shamrock and Bossman did a 5.3-3.6 to 3. 6 for Conan vs. Booker T and Steiner vs. Hall non-match, and the beginning of The Rock and Undertaker vs. Austin and Mankind did a 5.6-3.7 to a 3. 7 for the Steiner Hall non-finish, a Bret Hart interview, and the non-triangle match with Goldberg, Bigelow, and Nash. The American promotional war has spread to Mexico and the political ramifications, which are just starting now, will be the catalyst for most of the news in Mexico in 1999. The WCW presence at Arena Mexico began on December 4 with an interesting twist since it involved wrestlers under contract to WCW facing a wrestler under contract to WWF in a match taped for American television. The end result is that, while none of this is finalized, that Victor Quinones, who works for the WWF as a consultant for the WWF Super Astros project, and Carlos Mainz, who was the leading promoter in Mexico in the late 70s and early 80s before his top talent got stale and, well, you know the story, are talking about opening a promotion in 1999 which would feature Mexican and Puerto Rican wrestlers under contract to WWF and it or Quinones, and filling the undercards with promising wrestlers who wouldn't be put under contract but who would be attracted with the carrot dangled of it being the quickest route to a WWF contract since most of the EMLL talent also isn't under contract. With Paco Alonso now working with WCW, choosing them ahead of WWF, although Alonso has claimed to many that no formal contract has been signed with WCW, WWF, through a Vince McMahon directive, is looking at signing 8-10 to 10 of Alonso's top stars to headline for the new group. Thus far three wrestlers have been signed from EMLL, Negro Casas, Apollo Dantes and Ray Bucanero, who appeared without his mask on Super Astros this weekend under the name Ray Pirata Ortiz, and that name probably is why he was confused in virtually all U.S. reports including in original results in this newsletter for being Pirata Morgan, whose real last name is also Ortiz as Bucanero is I believe the nephew of Morgan. WWF has also signed Tarzan Boy, Armando Fernandez is his U.S. ring name, real name Oziel Toscano, who had been wrestling in northern Mexico since the folding of Promo Azteca. El Hijo del Santo hasn't signed his contract, although he has been appearing regularly as the top-pushed star on Super Astros, and the directive has been given that Santo won't be brought back to the United States until he signs the contract. WWF officials appear confident that Santo is on their side and simply hasn't signed the paper, and are hopeful of making a major press announcement in Mexico after Christmas of Santo's official signing. The directive to rate Alonso of top talent is such that when both Super Crazy and Antifas del Norte, who wrestled as Manuel Gomez, put on great performances at Astros tapings but weren't offered contracts because they've put a budget on the Super Astros talent roster, and don't want to spend any of that budget at this point on talent they aren't rating from Alonso. From a U.S. standpoint, the December 6th Super Astros show was a significant ratings decline in every major market except Chicago, where the show grew to a whopping 15.5 Hispanic rating from 14.0 the previous week, in particular a drop from a 6.7 to 4.7 in Los Angeles and 5.1 to 3.4 in New York. Although it's probably too early to jump to any conclusions over a one-week ratings drop, concern has already set in at Univision internally with the feeling that since WWF, with Sanu as the noted exception because he wouldn't come otherwise and they wanted him bad enough to break policy, won't allow any of the luchadores to wear masks, that the Mexican portion of the audience won't accept lucha libre without masks. There is also that aspect in attracting talent, as Dr. Wagner Jr., who is also under contract to New Japan as a regular, is probably the best working heel at EMLL, and both the fact he'd have to unmask and his New Japan deal make him harder to get than the others. But he is the top talent out there. In addition, several of the EMLL wrestlers had American working visas taken out for them by WCW, Emilio Charles Jr., Wagner Jr. and Atlantis all come to mind, 
which causes other political problems if they were to sign with WWF. The December 4th Arena Mexico saw the return of WCW talent Vampiro with purple hair and a Marilyn Manson gimmick, who is tentatively scheduled to debut at the Georgia Dome as a heel with a big push, Hector Garza and Dandy along with a surprise run-in by Juventud Guerrera. The return of the three wrestlers under contract to WCW picked the crowd up from the 4,000 range it has been averaging every Friday to 7,500 in the 17,670-seat building. Vampiro and Garza and Dandy, billed as a trio representing WCW, were scheduled to face Zumbido and Bestia Salvaje and Scorpio Jr., scheduled as the A-Block tournament winners, in the first round of the tournament, which would end with an angle involving CMLL heavyweight chump Ryo de Jalisco Jr. and Vampiro to build for a December 18th title match and title change, and cause the WCW team to be eliminated in the first round. However, booking changes were made to do an angle over two matches with Ryo and Vampiro, plus with Juventud there, to another angle involving Fuerza Guerrera, Juventud's father. This led to the brackets being changed and the WCW team facing Fuerza Guerrera and Gran Marcus Jr. and Apollo Dantes, a WWF wrestler. At some point in all this, since the WCW team was still supposed to go over and lose to Sumbito's team in the finals, it was suggested that Dantes do the job. Dantes, who came to the building not realizing he would be facing WCW wrestlers, freaked out about the change in matches and the potential heat he feared from the home office by just being in the ring with WCW talent on a show tape for the US, refused to do the job. So it wound up with Marcus doing the job in the first round. Vampiro ended up not helping Dandy and Garza, who were wearing their LWO t-shirts, and who ended up winning the match. They teased a post-match handshake with Vampiro, doing the heel turn, and Fuerza. Vampiro then distracted Ryo causing him to lose with Shocker and Mr. Niebla and the other tournament first rounder to Scorpio Jr. and Sumbido and Salvaje. In the Group A Finals, Ryo came back out and began fighting with Vampiro, which saw a 3 on 2 on Dandy and Garza who ended up both getting pinned. Fuerza Guerrero returned at this point, but was attacked by Dandy and Garza, and finally Juventud hit the ring, and even though this airs on US TV, it has Juventud flipping off Dandy and Garza and doing DX crotch chops. It turned into a near ride at this point as a 15-year-old fan hit Fuerza with a Pepsi bottle and Juventud ran into the crowd and attacked him. As it turns out the fan was from a well-connected family, his father a major newspaper editor and his uncle a Televisa exec and in the December 8th newspaper drive Alfonso Morales said because of it, even though he started the riot, probably nothing would be done about it. Several of the fans' teenage friends joined in the fight and the newspapers reported that Fuerza and Juventud did a real number on all of them. This sets up the December 11th main event as Ryo and Dandy and Garza vs. Vampiro and Fuerza and Juventud in Juventud's in ring debut at Arena Mexico. The only other WCW wrestlers scheduled on the card are Silver King and Viano 5, who will team with Viano Tercero in the Group B Trios tournament for the vacant CMLL Trios belts. It should be noted that one of the other teams in the same tourney is Santo and Casas and Felino. Before the card was announced, the newspapers in Mexico were reporting that Conan, La Parca and Eddie Guerrero all were being talked with about appearing on the December 11th show. Plans when it comes to Mexico, and WCW for that matter, are all last-minute stuff and communication is bad so nobody really knows how, when, and where this angle is going to end up. There has been talk of Conan, Sonny Wanu and J.J. Dillon appearing on December 11th, but now that it's actually this week, it probably won't happen. Conan did officially get his wrestling license in the DF, it had been rumored the commission wouldn't let him back, and there was a claim by Antonio Pena trying to keep Conan, Parca and Garza from being licensed but Garza appearing tells what happened to that complaint. Alonzo did ask WCW for Rey Mysterio Jr., who has never worked Arena Mexico, which would be the equivalent in Mexico to Madison Square Garden in the United States, on December 11th, but scheduling wasn't worked out and the request was denied. The World Wrestling Federation's Capital Carnage United Kingdom only pay-per-view show from the London Arena on December 6 turned into largely a regular house show with some lengthy added interviews and our reports indicate it was a thumbs-in-the-middle type pay-per-view show but a very heated event live. It was the WWF's second attempt at a UK-only pay-per-view show, and some of the political problems that plagued the first show more than 14 months earlier and led to it taking so long for a second one were still evident, as many of the major cable systems in the UK didn't carry the event. We're told the first show in September 1997 was carried by 25% of the cable systems in the UK, and this show was cleared by 80%, and the total buys were doubled out of the first show, which would actually be a buy rate decrease itself since clearances were more than tripled and the first buy rate at the time was considered disappointing.
The event drew a sellout crowd of 10,441 paying the equivalent of $412,147 in US currency, with the event sold out literally months ahead of time for the first WWF appearance in the UK since early in the year with huge scalper demand. The show is expected to be released in a few weeks in the US for home video. Although basically everyone advertised to appear was there, the lineup itself was changed frequently over the past few weeks and the eventual lineup was somewhat different than the last one advertised with no reasons given other than the explanation that Vince McMahon and The Rock were pulling a swerve on DX, who supposedly didn't know until they got in the building that X-Pac would be getting Triple H's title shot, probably in reality because they weren't sure if Triple H's knee would hold up in a main event title match and because X-Pac and Rock would be expected to be a better match. The Sable Jacqueline women's title match, the original plan was for Sable to win the title on this show but it was moved up to the Survivor Series show, was turned into the same mixed tag they've been doing at the house shows because they didn't want to risk Sable doing much physical before her Playboy shoot, negotiations of which were completed this past week and the shoot will be taking place in a few weeks, in case of bruising or injury. So she was put in a match where they used the men to do the work and she basically just came in for the big pop at the end. The X-Pac vs. Steven Regal European title match, which I would presume was when first scheduled to be a title change for Regal, was dropped from the show when Regal was pulled from all his bookings after not being in condition to perform and it has been reported that he is currently undergoing rehab. A in a match that wasn't taped, draws pinned Mosh in 6 minutes with a roll-up using the ropes. Draws and Animal were arguing throughout with Draws playing strong heel in this match. Apparently this had a dual purpose one to get the show started in advance of the pay-per-view start so fans wouldn't arrive late, and second to position LOD as the heels when the two teams met on the pay-per-view show. One quarter star. One. Gangrel pinned Al Snow in eight minutes after Edge came off the top rope with a missile drop kick on Snow. Fans were into the match but there were several blown spots by Gangrel and it wasn't good. Dud. Two. Headbangers beat Animal and Draws in four minutes. Fans were chanting we want Hawk. Again Draws and Animal mainly argued, and this led to Mosh pinning Draws. Animal and Draws argued some, then wound up with a pull apart, ending with Animal walking out on Draws. Dud. 3. Val Venus pinned Goldust in 5 minutes. Big pop for the ring entrances but not much heat for the match itself. The crowd did take to Goldust as the face. It sounded as though it was the same house show match they've been doing. Goldust set Venus up for shattered dreams only for the ref to block it. Venus ended up winning with a schoolboy holding the trunks, after the match, in the only big pop of the match, Bulldust delivered the shattered dreams to Venus. One star. In what was described as the highlight of the show, Vince McMahon, Shane McMahon, Gerald Briscoe and Pat Patterson came out for an interview that went 15 minutes. Shane made references to Vinnie Jones, a famous British soccer star who was in Steve Austin's corner for the main event, being hooked up with George Michael. A lot of fans cheered Shane as he made that remark. McMahon played the typical xenophobic hill role, saying that the U.S. was going to invade and take over Great Britain and appoint a Pakistani to be Prime Minister. Naturally this got great heat. 4. Tiger Ali Singh pinned Edge in 3 minutes using the ropes for leverage. 1 star. Vinnie Jones did a nationalistic babyface interview standing up for Britain against American tyranny. 5. Sable and Christian beat Jacqueline and Mark Merrow in 5 minutes. The match had good heat. To explain the storyline, since on TV, Merrow and Jacqueline split up a few weeks ago. They were arguing during the match. No word on what Merrow is doing since he's supposed to be retired. It wound up with Merrow and Christian brawling to the back leaving the women in the ring. Sable ended up pinning Jacqueline with the TKO. Jacqueline's strap of her top was pulled down by Sable and her breast fell out. One and a half stars. 6. Ken Shamrock beat Steve Blackman with the ankle lock submission to retain the IC title in 8 minutes. Bossman interfered toward the finish. Match had what was described as reasonable heat. One and a quarter star. Rock did an interview pretending to forget his own catchphrases, and instead talked about saying prayers and eating. To be the man you've gotta beat. I'm the best there is, the best there was. And even that's the bottom line, because. Before delivering his own catchphrase if you smell what the Rock is cooking. He also called X Pac a bony jibroni. 7. Hunter Hearst Helmsley pinned Jeff Jarrett in 8 minutes with a pedigree. 2 stars. 8. New Age Outlaws retained the WWF tag titles beating D'Lo Brown and Mark Henry in 10 minutes when Billy Gunn pinned Brown after a pile driver. As expected, the opening monologue by the Outlaws was super over. 2 stars. 9. Rock beat X-Pac via DQ in 13 minutes. 
This was said to be similar to their recent television match, but not as good of a match. Internally this was thought to be the best match on the show. The Heat wasn't up to expectations, perhaps because nobody took X-Pac seriously as a title contender. Finish saw Triple H do a run-in for a crowd-killing DQ. After the match it ended in a four-way brawl with Triple H and X-Pac fighting with Rock and Shamrock before DX chased Team Corporate away. Two and three-quarter stars. Ten. In the same basic four-way match they've been doing in every city, Steve Austin won over Undertaker, Kane and Rock in 15 minutes. Briscoe was the referee, Shane McMahon was ring announcer, Patterson was the timekeeper and Bossman was at ringside as the corporate enforcer. Vince came to ringside to announce this match with Jim Ross and Jerry Lawler. Jones's participation was limited to shoving Bossman back and forth until Bossman took a bump and then Bossman was sent to the back. Some of the match was real good and other points weren't that good, which is similar to their house show match. Briscoe wouldn't count as Austin had the match won. Austin then gave Briscoe a stunner and Kane a stunner and Earl Heckner ran in for the three count. The show ended with Austin, Jones and Heckner drinking beer in the ring together. Three stars. Real World Tag League Tournament Champions 1977 Dory and Terry Funk 1978 Giant Baba and Jumbo Surda 1979 Dory and Terry Funk 1980 Giant Baba and Jumbo Surda 1981 Bruiser Brody and Jimmy Snuka 1982 Dory and Terry Funk 1983, Bruiser Brody and Stan Hansen. 1984, Jumbo Tsurita and Genichiro Tenryu. 1985, Stan Hansen and Ted DiBiase. 1986, Jumbo Tsurita and Genichiro Tenryu. 1987, Jumbo Tsurita and Yoshiaki Yatsu. 1988, Stan Hansen and Terry Gordy. 1989, Stan Hansen and Genichiro Tenryu. 1990, Terry Gordy and Steve Williams. 1991 Terry Gordy and Steve Williams 1992 Meet Suharu Misawa and Toshiaki Kawada 1993 Meet Suharu Misawa and Kenta Kobashi 1994 Meet Suharu Misawa and Kenta Kobashi 1995 Meet Suharu Misawa and Kenta Kobashi 1996 Akira Tawe and Toshiaki Kawada 1997 Akira Tawe and Toshiaki Kawada 1998 Kenna Kobashi and Jun Akiyama. Japanese Television Rundown. November 14th, New Japan. 1. Liger and El Samurai and Wagner Jr. beat Kanemoto and Takaiwa and Atani in 1614. The last 10 minutes aired. This was even one step up from their usual excellent match with all the big moves and great heat and everyone looking excellent. Wagner ended up pinning Kanemoto after all sorts of near falls, with a Michinoku driver too. Four and a half stars. 2. Tenzan and Adams and Hiro Saito beat Kensuke Sasaki and Kazuo Yamazaki and Manabu Nakanishi in 1416, when Tenzan pinned Yamazaki after a headbutt off the top rope. Yamazaki looked great and Adams looked bad. 2 and 1 quarter stars. 3. Tatsumi Fujinami and Hashimoto and Yuji Nagata beat NWO Sting and Muto and Kojima in 1524. Fairly good match ending when Kojima accidentally lariated Sting, and Hashimoto pinned Sting after a DDT. After the match Adams and Michael Wall Street started arguing with Kojima about costing Sting the match. Muto ended up being the peacemaker, and they all posed together in the ring. Two and three quarter stars. Four. Nagata and Kazuyuki Fujita beat Don Fry and Brian Johnston in 958. This was a surprisingly good match. Nagata is just an awesome worker and Fry has the personality. Fujita is this green roided out monster but he works great with Fry and Johnston showed much improvement. A lot of submissions and a really stiff believable looking match ending with Nagata making Johnston tap out to the ankle lock. There was the usual big schmaz at the end including David Benito doing another run-in and Nagata squaring off against Fry. 3 stars. November 21st New Japan. 1. Dr. Wagner Jr. pinned Kendo Kashin in 1139 after a Michinoku driver 2. Only the last 3.30 aired but it looked good. 2. Tatsuhiro Takaiwa pinned Koji Kanemoto in 1606 to become the top contender for the IWGP Junior title. Kanemoto hit some brutal kicks. Takaiwa came with his triple bomb at a lariat. Kanemoto blocked a Death Valley bomb off the middle rope with a knee to the face. At that point Kanemoto tried to leap off the top rope into a reverse Frankensteiner but the entire move was botched. They recovered quickly enough and Takaiwa reversed an attempted tiger suplex into a Death Valley bomb. 
Kanemoto struggled to his feet and was hit with a lariat and a rabbit lariat for the pin. Only the last five minutes aired. Three and a half stars. Three. Jushin Liger pinned Shinjiro Atani in 1635. Only the last five minutes aired. This was a superheated great match with all kinds of big moves and near falls. Atani did all his springboard moves toward the end picking up the crowd momentum, but Liger wound up with a palm blow followed by a brain buster off the top for the pin. Four and a quarter stars. Four. Keiji Muto and Satoshi Kojima and Brian Adams beat Genichiro Tenryu and Shiro Koshinaka and Mishiyoshi Ohara in 1729. The last 10 minutes aired. Another real good match, largely due to Kojima and Tenryu. Adams was hardly ever involved and Muto had his working shoes on big time in this one. It was building to an excellent match until Adams tagged in, and while he plays a good monster because his size is unique, he's so far out of his league ability wise here it isn't funny. Match ended with Kojima and Hiroyoshi Tenzan going at it outside the ring. While in the ring, Muto blocked Ohara's choke slam, used two dragon screws and a figure four for the submission. Three and a half stars. Five. Scott Norton beat Shinya Hashimoto to retain the IWGP heavyweight title in 1119. The match itself was fairly good for what it was, but the countout finish didn't work. Hashimoto was on a fence mainly working on Norton's left arm and shoulder. Norton came back and went for his power bomb, but the arm gave out. They ended up outside the ring and Norton gave Hashimoto a body block into the post and Hashimoto hit head first and was knocked out and carried out. Since New Japan main events always end clean in the middle, fans weren't ready for this to be the finish. Actually this finish was taken from a famous match about 15 years ago between Jumbo Tsurida and Bruiser Brody which worked big, but that was in an era when fans accepted fluke finishes. Two and three quarter stars. November 22nd All Japan. 1. Vader and Hansen beat Kobashi and Akiyama in 1449 of a very physical match. Kobashi looked great working with Vader. Vader isn't as fast or as impressive as he was years ago, but there is clearly a lot of life left in him. Finish saw Vader splash Akiyama, followed by a stuff power bomb and Hansen hit Akiyama with a lariat for the pin. Three and a half stars. 2. Ace and Gun beat Misawa and Ogawa in 1349. Ogawa looked great in his role as the smaller underdog type teaming with the top star. Fans are looking for Ogawa to grow into his position so they are into his offense on the bigger guys. Gun's work was solid but he has no charisma. It looks totally different from WWF with the crew cut and the new non-muscular physique but people seem to accept him as they want somebody new and he is a big guy whose technical work isn't bad and he is put in a good spot. Ace and Gun did screw up a combination power bomb and clothesline off the top spot on Misawa. Finish saw Ace use the Ace Crusher off the ropes on Misawa, followed by an implant DDT which is called the Johnny Spike. Three and a quarter stars. November 29th All Japan. 1. Vader and Hansen and Manukia Mossman beat Misawa and Ogawa and Tamun Honda in 1456 when Hansen lariated both Misawa and Honda and scored the pin on Honda. Everyone was working hard to get Vader over. Two stars. Two. Kawada and Tawei beat Ace and Gun in 1755. The first 10 minutes were pretty slow and Gun looked bad. They picked things up but it was still bad until the last 4 minutes, and Ace worked basically the entire closing minutes. Kawada ended up pinning Ace with Yen Zudri. One and a half stars. Mexico. Besides the angles involving WCW talent, the December 4th Arena Mexico was actually headlined by Mascara Año 2000 over Pierre Roth Jr. and Bloodbath with a lot of foreign objects including the grating from an air conditioner being used. The newspaper Ovaciones went on at length about how other promotions in the DF get in trouble with the commission for doing the objects but that on an EMLL show they did it right in front of the commissioners and they didn't say a word. Black Warrior beat Felino to retain the NWA light heavyweight title in a match where Felino did a stretcher job, and Warrior knocked him off the stretcher, so it appears they are building to a mask versus mask match that Warrior would probably lose. On the December 11th show underneath the match with the WCW guys the four teams in Group B of the trios tournament are Silver King and Villanos Tercero and Five, Felino and El Eo Del Santo and Negro Casas, Black Warrior and Blue Panther and Dr. Wagner Jr., and Atlantis and Lismark Sr. and Emilio Charles Jr. The winners of this group faces Scorpio Jr. and Bestia Salvaje and Zumbido for the titles on December 18th. The AAA War Zone show on December 13th in Chihuahua has Octagon and Heavy Metal vs. Pentagon and Kickboxer as the main event with Huicho Dominguez and Tarantes as the respective seconds. 
There will be stipulations for this match announced sometime this week. The undercard is nothing really special with Sangre Chicana and Espectro Jr. and Cobarde Sr. vs. El Alabrije and Latin Lover and Pero Aguayo Abismo Negro vs. The Panther for Mexican National Middleweight title and Los Vipers vs. Los Vados Locos. El Satanico beat Negro Casas on December 2 at La Carpet Astros Arena in Mexico City to retain the CMLL middleweight title. Casas and Santa lost again when challenging CMLL tag champ Salvaje and Scorpio Jr. on December 3 in Aguascalientes. A legends trio of Mel Mascaras and Pero Ogueo and Connect beat Cybernetico and Electroshock and Pentagon on the AAA show on November 22 in Juarez. Antonio Pena is said to be wanting to set up a meeting with Ron Scholar, who promoted AAA shows in the United States, very successfully from 1992 to 94, including some huge gates, at the Los Angeles Sports Arena, to start running the U.S. again. Pierre Roth Jr. beat American Destroyer on November 16 in Nuevo Laredo in a hair vs. mask match. Destroyer was revealed as Edward Bogak, former WCW jobber Eddie Jackie, who worked as Perfect 10 in Puerto Rico on November 22 in Monterey Pantry to Del Ring beat White Wolf in a mask versus mask match, revealing him as Andy Anderson, 23, from Canada. Anderson is probably best known in the U.S. for a spot in Nashville on a raw taping where he was a security guard outside the building that was supposed to keep Steve Austin from entering and you probably remember what happened. Before going to Mexico, he had worked for Music City. La Fiera is out of action with torn ligaments in his shoulder and upper back from landing wrong doing a Huracan Rana on December 5. Ovacianes ran an article very critical of a lot of the recent frauds they are claiming. The items brought up were the November 30th show in Nuevo Laredo where they had an eight-man losers advanced tournament in a cage with the ultimate loser losing his mask called the Dungeon of Death. The men entered were T. Nieblas Jr., Mr. Niebla, Biano Tercero Felino, Mosco de la Merced, Scorpio Jr., Lismark Sr. and Antifas del Norte, who worked without his mask in WWF already and is the son of the promoter in Monterey. Viano Tercero no-showed and was replaced by Pierroth Jr., who doesn't wear a mask, with Pierroth Jr. saying that he would shave his head if he lost the tournament. The fact they put a guy without a mask in the tournament was labeled a fraud in the newspaper, however Pierroth Jr. is a huge star and a more than adequate replacement for Viano Tercero. Mosco ended up losing, revealing himself to be Juan Francisco Dominguez. This was also called a fraud because the original Mosco lost in court to Pena the right to use the name, Pena has created his own Mosco, in the first place, although that's no different than Dionisio Castellano still using the psychosis gimmick that Pena created and gave to someone else. They also brought up the November 9th Pierroth Jr. win over American Destroyer in a boxing match, to set up the hair versus mask the next week, since the boxing match was worked and is illegal in Mexico to work a boxing match. They also claimed that the night after Pierroth Jr. lost his mask this summer in the highly publicized match with La Parca, he worked another match where he put up and lost his mask. All Japan This promotion dominated the 1998 Tokyo Sports Press Awards which were released on December 8. The awards are known for being highly political, in that they try to spread the wealth so to speak, which is why it's strange to see one company dominate. Kana Kobashi was named MVP, garnering 13 of the 22 ballots with Mitsuharu Masawa getting 7 and Alexander Otsuka and Masahiro Chono each getting 1. The Kobashi vs. Misawa Budokan Hall match on October 31st where Misawa won the title was voted match of the year. In a surprise, Vader and Stan Hansen were named tag team of the year, since they only teamed together for one dome show, which they lost, and a three-week tournament, which they also didn't win. In the first ballot, Vader and Hansen got 10 votes while Genichiro Tenryu and Shiro Koshinaka got 5, but since neither got a majority, they were put in a one-on-one -on -one balloting and Vader and Hansen won 12 to 10. As far as a tag team this year that had the biggest impact, they were the team. Yoshinobu Kanemaru, who actually debuted in the summer of 1996, was voted Rookie of the Year while Jun Akiyama was awarded Best Spirit, kind of like a Hardest Worker Award. The only awards this company didn't win were an award given to Alexander Otsuka for Fastest Rising Popularity, an award to Yuji Nagata for Best Technical Wrestler, beating Kazuo Yamazaki 12-10 in a runoff after they each tied with seven votes on first ballot, and Outstanding Wrestler Awards to Keiji Muto and Hiramichi Fuyuki. Shinobu Kondori was named Women's MVP, which she pretty much had to win holding both the LLPW and WWWA world titles most of the year. Kyoko Hambuchi was given a special award, and awards were also given to retiring Antonio Inoki, referee Mr. Takahashi, great Kabuki and the late Toyono Bori. This really hasn't gotten much notoriety in recent years, 
But the story came back this past week when Giant Baba had a bad cold which caused him to miss the December 2nd and a December 3rd house shows. Baba is actually the ultimate Cal Ripken of sports. From his pro debut on September 30, 1960 until suffering a neck injury on April 25, 1984 in a match against Bruiser Brody and Stan Hansen, Baba never missed a match in Japan, a record of 3,711 consecutive games over nearly 24 years. After returning from that injury, Baba never missed another match until he suffered a broken leg on November 30, 1990 which kept him out of action for six months. He also missed a show on April 19, 1992 due to an illness, and hadn't missed another show in more than six years. Granted his style in the ring during the 90s has been a totally easy comedy match style which has virtually no injury risk, but from the early 60s through the late 80s, he was a main event performer and while the style wasn't as risky as today, a 3,711 consecutive game streak in a sport that is a hell of a lot more dangerous than baseball is something that I can almost guarantee will never be approached in any of our lifetimes. It was at the point when Baba missed the show on December 2nd, just because he never misses shows, that rumor started that he was either dying or having to retire. But it was actually just a very bad flu, and he returned on December 4th. Baba has also released his 240-page autobiography. Hiroshi Hazi will return for several dates in early January, including a January 3rd Karakuen Hall main event of Misawa and Hazi vs. Vader and Manukia Mossman. Vader will largely team with Mossman on the tour since Hansen isn't on the January tour. The first show of the new year will be January 2nd at Karakuen Hall with Misawa and Yoshinari Ogawa and Jinsei Shinzaki vs. Kobashi and Akiyama and Kentaro Shiga as the main event plus the annual heavyweight battle royal. The January 3rd show will have the annual junior heavyweight battle royal. All Japan battle royals are notorious for being the worst in wrestling. Headhunters have signed a three-year deal guaranteeing 12 weeks per year with this group. November 22nd TV show did a 5.2 rating for the first Kobashi and Akiyama vs. Vader and Hansen match. New Japan There still has been nothing announced for the UFO December 30th Osaka Castle Hall show officially. They ran an angle on the December 4th New Japan show at Osaka Furitsu Gym for a sellout 6,500 when Don Fry wrestled Yuji Nagata. Although Fry won the match via knockout in 901, during the match Brian Johnston turned on Fry, or vice versa. Also in Osaka, they had a surprise result as Shinjiro Atani and Koji Kanemoto beat Dr. Wagner Jr. and Kendo Kashin when Kanemoto pinned Wagner after a Tiger suplex in 836, since Wagner and Kashin will be challenging for the IWGP Jr. tag title at the Dome Show. Jushin Liger retained the IWGP Jr. title beating Tatsuhito Takaiwa in 1802 with a Shota, Palm Blow. The main event saw Scott Norton retain the IWGP heavyweight strap pinning Manabu Nakanishi in 7.53 after a powerbomb after three clotheslines. Norton after the match challenged both Tenryu and Naoya Ogawa, which I guess was the original plan before Keiji Muto changed things. It's going to be interesting what happens since Norton was promised a lengthy title reign and the plan when changing the dome match was for Muto to get the title. There will be a special retirement ceremony for Masa Saito on February 14th at Budokan Hall. Saito, 56, actually hasn't wrestled in a few years and does the color commentary on television. He'll be brought back for one final match against Great Muda. The TV play-by-play -play announcer Tsuji is leaving to try acting, other announcing ventures. His final show will be the January 4th Dome card. New Japan's only remaining show of the year is December 23rd at Karakuen Hall with Kensuke Sasaki vs. Atani as the main event. November 21st TV show did a 3.1 rating. Other Japan notes. Rings has the semi-finals of its Battle Dimension tournament on December 23rd in Fukuoka with Georgia, of the former Soviet Republic as opposed to Georgia the Willie Nelson song, versus Russia B and Japan of versus Holland. Not sure how the latter team will work because Yoshihisa Yamamoto suffered a hernia and is out of action, so don't know if they'll replace him on the team but believe it'll be Masayuki Naruse, who was part of the losing Japan B team. They also have a non-tournament match with Kiyoshi Tamura vs. Kenichi Yamamoto which if given time, could be a classic. Akira Maeda is going to Russia from December 10th to December 16th to put the finishing touches on the Alexander Karelin deal and finalize the rules the match will be under. Due to all sorts of problems with ECW, FMW has not announced anything for its December 12th and December 13th Karakuen Hall shows because they don't trust who is going to be there after Bam Bam Bigelow, Chris Condito and Tammy Sitch all no-show their November 20th pay-per-view date. 
Cebu is already there and at last where the entire main ECW crew was scheduled for at least the December 12th and December 13th dates, but not the December 11th date which is a show Atsushi Onita is putting together on his own using wrestlers from the early days of FMW, including bringing back the Sheik for the final time in Japan. Sheik, 69 who suffered a heart attack after a match in FMW a few years back, will be honored at the show, but not wrestle on the show. The shows are instead being built around an over-the-top single elimination tournament. The tournament starts December 9th in Osaka with Ghetto vs. Hayabusa, Isakatsu Oya vs. Hiramichi Fuyuki, Tetsuhiro Kuroda vs. Super Leather and Mohamed Yone vs. Gasaku. On December 12th at Karakuen Hall will be Koji Nakagawa vs. Mr. Ganesuke, Hideki Hasaka vs. Yukihiro Kanemura, Takeshi Ono vs. Haido and Masao Orihara vs. Riki Fuji. The four quarter final and two semi final matches all take place on December 13th, with the two winners advancing to the season opener show at Karakuen Hall on January 5th. Masato Tanaka returned from ECW on December 7th. Big Japan had a major show on December 5th at Yokohama Bunka Gym with Shadow WX, Satoru Shiga, and Tomoaki Homa capturing the vacant Big Japan tag titles, beating Jason the Terrible, Roberto Rodriguez, and Shadow Winger, Takashi Okano and Fantastique from Mexico from the Big Japan Junior title pinning Katsumi Yujuda of the Battle Arts promotion. Ken Suzuki's You Dream 98 show on December 11th in Toyama has an interesting mix with Yoji Anjo, Ensign Inoue and Yoshiaki Fujiwara as the headliners. December 19th Pancrase looks to have a strong advance. Here and there. Some more notes on the death of Martin Ruane on November 30th, we had incorrectly last week listed the death on November 23rd. There was a ton of mainstream pub in the UK this past week both on the death and the funeral held on December 4th. Ruane, who was best known in England as Giant Haystacks and also Luke McMasters, and also worked for Stampede Wrestling as the Loch Ness Monster and for WCW as Loch Ness, was listed as 52 in most stories although some feel he was a few years older than that, and according to our records, his age would be 55. Most media sources were also inflating his size during his wrestling days as 6 foot 11, 700 pounds. The tabloid London Sun ran the story of his death on the front page on November 2nd, with a pair of sensationalized articles. It said among his fans were Queen Elizabeth and Sir Paul McCartney. It quotes Haystacks as saying McCartney loved pro wrestling and took his son to matches. At his peak in England, Haystacks it was said never earned more than 600 pounds, approximately $1,000 in his best weeks and lost what money he had saved in a car business. Among the items noted about Haystacks, which no doubt were tall tales similar to those told in the rest of the world about Andre the Giant, included his grandfather being 7 foot 4 and that he weighed 14 pounds 6 ounces at birth, that hurts just thinking about it the Memphis TV on December 5th opened with Randy Hales meeting with Tony Falk. Hales told Falk to find Brandon Baxter, handcuff him and bring him to Hales. Dave Brown made the announcement that there was an incident which took place on last week's television that would never happen again. It was never said exactly what that was but it is believed to have been the angle where Stacy was tied up in her underwear. He said that management has taken the proper steps since they are family friendly. There are angles on television that Brown acts like he's disgusted by, but Brown actually has a great deal of say so in what goes on television so in most of those instances he's just selling the angles. Lance Jade won the Young Guns title pinning Derek King in a Four Corners match that also included Kid Wicked and Aaron O'Grady. Falk went into the parking lot to get Baxter, and wouldn't you know it, it wound up with Falk winding up getting handcuffed to a post. The TV main event between Bill Dundee and Brian Christopher ended with a DQ on Christopher when Sean Stasiak hit Dundee with a chain. This sets up Lawler and Dundee vs. Christopher and Stasiak as next week's TV main event. It was also announced on the show that the WWF would be doing a pay-per-view show on February 14th at the Pyramid. The show ended with Baxter throwing powder in Falk's face, attacking Hales and throwing him in the trunk of his car and driving off. Dwayne Gill defended the WWF light heavyweight title in the opener on an Axel Rotten Maryland Championship wrestling show on December 2nd, in Glen Burnie, Maryland beating two dope. Val Venus and Christian Cage from WWF headline the Pennsylvania Championship Wrestling Show on December 4th in Reading, Pennsylvania. There may be some indie confusion in Ohio after a split between Wayne Kreiderman, Crusher Klein, and the owner of Body Slammers Gym in Lima, Ohio, best known for being run for years by Al Snow. Kreiderman has left the Global Wrestling Alliance, and has taken most of the wrestlers with him, and will run his first show on December 30th in Lima, Ohio under the name Global Wrestling Association and Snow will be there signing autographs at the show. 
No word on any date or if there will be matches under the old Global Wrestling Alliance name in the area. And now for something even more absurd, coming to a WWF pay per view within the next year. The Grand Wrestling Alliance in Philadelphia had a match on December 5th, with a loser eats dog feces stipulation. Don't know if anyone ate anything. Blast from the past, besides such names as Demolition Axe, Jimmy Valiant, Ken Lucas, and Robert Gibson appearing for promoter Larry Strickland on December 5th in Bainbridge, Georgia was the name Don Fargo. Now I'm not going to say Don Fargo is old, but he was already a veteran in 1963 when he was Dory Funk Jr.'s first opponent in his Amarillo debut match. The pro wrestling debut of Mark Kerr, rated as the number one heavyweight in the world in MMA, scheduled for December 6th in Lancaster, California on an Empire Wrestling Federation show was to be against Tom Howard, who formerly worked as KGB in Mexico for the AAA promotion. We had several mistakes in the November 14th Mid-Eastern Wrestling Federation results from Hampstead, Maryland. Bob Starr beat Doink instead of Visa Versa. Ditto Jimmy Snuka over King Kong Bundy. Insane Clown Posse are opening up a group called Hellfire Wrestling on December 27th at the Majestic Theater in Detroit. ICP will wrestle using their wrestling names, Hector Hatchet and Seward Dwella as opposed to their musical names, Shaggy 2 Dope and Violent J. Former WCW announcer Chris Cruz promoted his first show on December 3rd in Thomasville, North Carolina for New Dimension Wrestling. Music City Wrestling has changed its name to NWA Worldwide Wrestling, perhaps in an attempt to capitalize on the current boom and have a better shot at major TV clearances. The whole deal reported last week regarding the death of pig greaser Stanklin appears to have been a ruse. Royal Duncan and Gary Will are publishing the fourth and final edition of their Wrestling Title Histories book, which is the reference book on this industry, in April and are looking for help from anyone who keeps accurate records of title changes. For info on the book or for anyone wishing to contribute you can write to Duncan at 7600 North Galena Road, Peoria, Illinois 61615. The first tapings of the new Roller Jam TV show for the Nashville Network took place over the weekend in Orlando, Florida at Universal Studios. They did a dry run on December 4th and a taping of the first two television shows on December 5th which will air starting on January 15th. Several WCW personnel were on hand including the Nitro crew being used to film the shows and Zane Bresloff being on hand as he's been offered the live event promotional rights and touring is very tentatively scheduled to begin in April. Just from the pub this thing has gotten there is already a rival promotion in the talking stages with Fox. Ken Resnick and the character who played Hawk on American Gladiators did the play-by-play, they had a babe doing trackside interviews, which means Missy Hyatt didn't get the gig, and Danny Wolf, who was in both the Learning Channel special and the NBC special as the television announcer and has a background in announcing roller derby in California, was the host. Jimmy Hart was asked to be involved but it was nixed by WCW. The shows are heavily scripted with a lot of fighting and pro wrestling style angles and booking. Some thought there was too much bad fighting a brawl after every jam which got old and in the very first show, they were already bumping the announcers, since the players were inexperienced making the fights look far more fake than they did in the old derby. The Nashville Network execs at the taping were already nervous about too much brawling and the dirty language, and it is said they will likely heavily edit the shows. One of the referees broke his arm legit, and they later re-scripted it into an angle. Most of the women skaters are models with Pamela Lee looks to be marketed like pro wrestling valets with a few former speed skaters thrown in. There also is consideration being given for a potential pay-per-view show if it catches on. Yokozuna was at the December 2nd Maryland Championship Wrestling Show in Glen Burn, Maryland but not allowed to wrestle because the Maryland Commission wouldn't allow him because they recognized the New York suspension. MMA. The K-1 Grand Prix takes place on December 13th at the Tokyo Dome. For whatever reason, there doesn't seem to be the hype behind this show as there was last year, even though it's largely the same men in the eight-man one-night tournament which features the biggest name kickboxers in the world. There has been virtually no news in recent weeks in the newspapers and I haven't seen any advertising for the show since the day tickets were put on sale. I'm assuming it sold out the dome almost immediately so there has been no need to hype ticket sales, but they still need some hype to build up the TV rating. 
This is considered a much bigger event in Japan than the January 4th New Japan show, and that New Japan show in Japan is considered equivalent in that country to WrestleMania in this country. The K1 event is probably more along the lines on the NCAA Final Four. The first round matches have Peter Ertz vs. Masaaki Sadake, Francisco Filio vs. Mike Bernardo, Andy Hug vs. Ray Sefo, and Ernesto Hust vs. Sam Greco, with the winners advancing. The previous K1 Grand Prix champions have been Branko Sikatic, 1993 Ertz, 94-95, Hook, 96, and Hust, 97 The January 8th UFC show has been completed, barring last-minute injuries and withdrawals that almost always seem to happen. It's the same matches reported here previously. Laverne Clark vs. Frank Karachi has been added as an off-pay-per-view dark match. The one match left to be filled will be Jerry Bolander vs. Pedro Tito Ortiz, a former wrestler at Cal State Bakersfield who went 1-1 and in a tournament in 1997, losing in the finals to Guy Mesger. There was some controversy in the Ortiz vs. Mesger fight because Ortiz had Mesger down in a bad position and was throwing knees to his head. Mesger got a cut on the back of his head and they stopped the match to get it examined. After it was restarted, Ortiz charged in for another tackle and was caught in a front guillotine and tapped out, actually in around two minutes. It was one of those situations where even though Mesger tapped him quickly, Mesger was given a lucky break when John McCarthy stopped it to examine him and Ortiz was all action and on a fence and got over to people who remember that fight. In regard to the proposed Bolander vs. Jason Godzi, Pankrace, match, which was pulled. There was a ton of controversy about it over the past week. Ken Shamrock's opinion was that he and Bolander were willing to accept the fight, but he didn't think it made sense to put Bolander, who is fighting as a middleweight, against a heavyweight. Semaphore Entertainment Group's plans, which never come to fruition as planned because this sport is rife with unpredictability, is to build up a Bolander vs. Vitor Belfort match on the three-fifths pay-per-view show as the semi-main event to the eventual heavyweight title match. The idea would then be to match the Bolander Belfort winner against Frank Shamrock in April or May as a pay-per-view main event. Where the Godzi match made no sense is that if Godzi won, it would take the luster off or kill a Bolander vs. Belfort match to determine the number one contender, even though Bolander would have lost to a heavyweight. In this case, if Ortiz should upset Bolander, at least he would become a viable opponent for Belfort. I was asked to be one of the judges for the January 8th pay-per-view show. Of complaints brought up to Jeff Blatnick mentioned in last week's issue, the main one address wasn't mentioned here, and that is Blatnick's Mac ruling that a promoter can't have financial interest in managing a fighter due to the conflict of interest. However, Sergio Battarelli, the promoter in Brazil, was also the manager of Vanderlei Silva, who appeared on that show. ECW There must be some sort of a major WCW raid on ECW going on as at press time, it appears that Mikey Whipwreck, John Watson, is going to accept a $100,000 per year two-year deal, that many others have been offered deals and that even Valet Chastity was given an offer and was considered at press time as 90% certain of leaving. All this is going on at the same time the ECW slash FMW relationship is in major heat. Originally ECW was going to work with FMW on three days at Karaku and Hall December 11th to December 13th, with Sabu going in early to work a full week and Bubba Ray and D. Von Dudley, Bill Alfonso, Rob Van Dam, Tommy Dreamer, Shane Douglas, Francine and Paul Heyman all scheduled to leave in midweek. There is tremendous heat between FMW and also the Direct TV of Japan due to Chris Condito, Tammy Sitch and Bam Bam Bigelow missing the November 20th FMW pay-per-view show and causing the company to have to rearrange the show on the day of the card. There are also disputes over plane tickets and alleged money owed over Bigelow's previous pay-per-view appearance where he was bumped up from coach to business class and FMW feeling ECW owed them money and for non-refundable tickets bought for Condito and Sitch that weren't used. When Sabu went to Japan in their place for the November 20th show, he presented it as if Paul Heyman was mad at him for going but he did so out of his own pocket and of loyalty to FMW, since they were the promotion that made him a star internationally before he was ever brought to ECW. Because Heyman was afraid he'd miss the ECW Arena show the next day, he made it back and worked the show. Heyman wanted to shoot at least two major angles in Japan and use the Japanese tape as this week's television show, and FMW wasn't happy about giving him the tape due to all the previous problems, in addition, there are problems in FMW between Atsushi Onita and the rest of FMW, and the ECW guys were already taken off Onita's own December 11th show. As of last word, the ECW guys were going, nobody knew what matches were going to take place with them as FMW was mainly pushing its own singles tournament for both nights and not pushing any ECW talent or matches. 
Dory Funk appeared at the November 29th show in Tampa and was asked to be part of the angle involving Tommy Dreamer and Terry Funk. Didn't happen. This past weekend's TV was from Fort Lauderdale on November 28th. Van Damme had a three and a quarter stars match with Mike Lazensky. Van Damme once again put on a one-man show here with one big move after another. They heavily edited a Dudley's vs. Masato Tanaka and Balls Mahoney and Hackmeyer's match to show mainly near falls, but aside from the false finishes, it didn't look good but the crowd liked it. This was mainly to set up Axel Rotten doing a run-in with a barbed wire baseball bat to set up his return. Apparently Rotten may not even get his needed gallbladder surgery because he can't afford it, but if slash when he's back in the ring here, he can't take many bumps. Finally they showed Sabu beating Roadkill with Taz and Shane Douglas watching from the stands. Sabu was selling as if he was near dead from the Taz injury, and Douglas was freaking that he still won but Taz was laughing. Lance Storm did a spoof on the Bret Hart movie in Buffalo on December 5th. He was scheduled to face Whipwreck and came out with a tape of the movie. He said they were as close to Canada as ECW gets. And he knows that Paul Heyman would try and screw him since he's from Calgary, so instead of having someone ring the bell on him while he's in a scorpion, he wasn't going to wrestle. That means ECW has now done more to promote Hart's movie than WCW. House shows this week were December 4th in Pittsburgh before 2700, December 5th in Buffalo before 2970 and December 6th in Altoona, Pennsylvania before 1074. In Pittsburgh, they did an angle involving several members of the Pittsburgh Steelers. The Dudleys challenged them and Chris Fuamatu Mafala, who is actually on injured reserve with a hamstring tear, hopped the rail and speared Bubba. Van Dam missed the show since he moved from Florida to Los Angeles this week so he can try his luck in Hollywood. So they had a battle royal, won by Tanaka, to get the title shot at Douglas, which Douglas won. Lots of other injuries as well. Jerry Lynn missed the week with a fractured pelvis and won't be back until the January 10th pay-per-view show. New Jack passed out backstage in Pittsburgh and was at the other shows, but only worked for about 30 seconds in Buffalo and didn't work at all in Altoona. He was diagnosed as having a pinched nerve which has left his left side numb. Douglas was knocked out in Buffalo during a three-way dance for the tag titles with he and Taz, Dudley's and Sabu and Van Dam, although nobody is certain exactly how it happened, and he basically had to be taken out of the match which screwed up all the plans of what they were planning for an angle in the match. They did an old ECW-style barbed wire bat match with Dudley's vs. Mahoney and Rotten and Altoona which was a bloodbath. They also debuted a new wrestler called Spanish Angel, real name Angel Medina, a Johnny Rod's protege, who put over Tommy Rogers underneath. In both Buffalo and Altoona they did angles where Just Incredible and Dreamer cost each other matches against Tanaka and the FBI the plan is for Supernova to take off his makeup and be pushed more as a serious wrestler and perhaps bring in some Northeast indie guys for him to work with underneath. Paul Heyman was down on Wolf Hockfield because with the height, the physique and the makeup, he reminded him of a poor version of Mike Awesome and Awesome was the better worker with the more charisma. One Man Gang is now doing a comedy gimmick as the enforcer for the FBI expect Condito and Sitch back in a few weeks and doing the pay-per-view. They had Sitch in a bikini showing her newest version of her surgically enhanced body all over TV, largely because she was representing ECW at a major TV convention and this show would be playing at the convention, and the idea was that the TV execs probably would walk by violent pro wrestling, but frequent bikini shots of her would make them pay attention to the product. Also expect Angles over the next few weeks to in some way make changes that would somehow involve Taz strongly in the storyline of the Douglas vs. Sabu title match. Lance Wright has quit. Johnny Smith won't be able to debut in January since he's on the All Japan Tour. In a Pennsylvania newspaper, Douglas challenged Ric Flair to a best-of-three shoot fight and claimed that wrestling had passed Flair by. When Douglas first did this stuff a few years back anyone with half a brain knew he was an asshole but it did get him over to some people with less than half a brain, and getting over was his job. But now with Douglas past both a physical and business prime as a star that he barely had to begin with and never having made it in the big leagues and Flair still at 49, still one of the biggest names in the big leagues, well, the only people who don't see this for what it is must have something like 1 20th of a brain. This is what it is for those who can't see. Douglas hopes someday if he talks enough, that he'll be in the same company as Flair and a booker will believe there is interest or money to have the two work a program together which clearly Douglas in ring ability clearly can't get him anywhere near that level, although if he talks enough for long enough, maybe he can convince people there is money in it. Has anyone ever thought about the fact that all these guys who talk about wanting to do shoot fights would have avenues open to them if they truly wanted to, and yet with only a few noted exceptions, none of those who talk the talk ever walk the walk. Because it's all part of the work,
WCW. Latest on the alleged and not so alleged criminal and irresponsible or unlucky behavior department. Scott Steiner plead guilty on December 7th on charges of felonious aggravated assault and making terroristic threats in the case where he bumped his car into the road worker. The judge accepted his plea this time as he spoke in a low voice with his head down in the courtroom. He faces a maximum 26 years in prison, but as a first time offender, won't be getting anything of the sort. He had a plea bargain agreement for probation and a $2,676 fine, but the judge didn't like the way Steiner was answering questions and pulled the deal. The judge didn't issue a sentence, turning the case over to state officials to conduct an investigation and determine a sentence. The giant was arrested after the December 3rd thunder in Memphis on charges of sexual battery from an incident that allegedly took place the previous night at the local Hilton the wrestlers were staying at. The charges were dropped the next day when other wrestlers came up with an alibi saying they were with him and the police didn't have enough physical evidence. Giant was accused by hotel clerk Minda Klitzer of coming up to her and saying, do you know why they call me the giant? As she responded, because you're so tall, and he responded with another reason, allegedly whipped it out and began rubbing on her. She was claiming she was going to file a civil suit after the criminal charges were dropped. Apparently, because of Giant's size, the police were scared to death the next day when they were given word to arrest him, and they sent 24 officers to the Mid-South Coliseum to pick him up. Many WCW wrestlers went to the jail to give him moral support, and it appears DDP is taking on the task of convincing him to stay with the company. Apparently Scott Hall's latest car wreck was his fourth or fifth in the last year. At one point he wrecked three cars in a month and two within 24 hours. There was a major article by Mike Mooneyham in the Charleston Post-Courier on November 29th after an interview with Dana Hall. The article stated Hall is under contract to WCW for $1.1 million this year and next year, $1.45 million in 2001, $1.625 million in 2001 but she feels the only way he can save his life is to walk away from the entire wrestling industry. Starcade up to this point has Goldberg vs. Nash, Flair vs. Bischoff with Dusty Rhodes as ref, presumably Hart vs. Hall for the US title, Hart has a groin injury legit and is supposed to be out of action for about 4 weeks, which makes Starcade a touch-and-go proposition, Page vs. Giant, Conan vs. Jericho for the TV title, Ernest Miller vs. Perry Saturn in a kickboxing match and a cruiserweight title match which originally was planned to be a triangle with Kidman, Juventud Guerrera, and Rey Mysterio Jr., although that plan could change. Speaking of plans, the idea that Nash wins the title and then hands the belt to Hogan and creates a new NWO with himself, Hall, Hogan and Luger which was reported here as an idea given up on is not a dead idea. While nothing had etched in stone, it still could happen. Sources close to Hogan indicate he's sitting this time out and letting things run their course. Hogan was going to be taking time off this time of year anyway to do a Muppet movie so this was just a way to garner more publicity. Gordon Nelson, a longtime member of the ring crew dating back to the Crockett days, and a former pro wrestler in the 60s and 70s, suffered a serious stroke while setting up the ring at the Nitro on November 30th in Chattanooga. As the week went on, he was moved from a hospital in Chattanooga back to Amarillo. It's not life-threatening, but he was at press time still paralyzed on the right side of his body. Nelson, originally from Canada, was a heavily respected shooter in his day known for his ability to use a chicken wing as a finisher in real-life skirmishes. He wrestled in California and Texas as Mr. Wrestling under a mask in the early 70s. He married woman wrestler Maria Laverne and his son is promoter slash wrestler Steve Nelson of Amarillo. He and Dory Funk Sr. used to shoot with each other in the Funk Kitchen all the time at wrestler parties in the early 70s. After finishing his wrestling career in the 70s, he worked as a referee in Texas and Florida before moving to ring crew first in Florida and later brought up to the Carolinas. December 7th Nitro in Houston opened with a tape of Steiner beating up Wildcat Willie and him doing an interview. I don't know of anyone who gets more of a push and more interview time in the business with catchphrases, who gets less reaction to his catchphrases than Steiner. He was out there so long fans were chanting Goldberg out of boredom, not out of heat. Page beat Kendall Windham in two minutes with the diamond cutter. They did a 240 long video on one of the Nitro girls. Way too long. WCW feels it needs Tanda to compete with WWF, and the Nitro Girls are its Tanda, but not when they do video packages talking about where they went to school and praising their dancing teacher. Smiley beat Prince Aokia in 2.52 with the chicken wing. Mysterio Jr. beats Silver King in 3.48 with a springboard bulldog off the top. Mysterio Jr. is going to a faster pace style again in the ring recognizing that's how he got over it in the first place. He was given advice to slow it down and work more American, but at his size. He can't get over working the same way everyone else does.
Wrath beat Renegade in 328 with the meltdown. When you see Renegade's physique and remember what it was, you see what really would happen if guys got off steroids. Disco Inferno came out and called out Conan, acting buddy-buddy and saying Nash invited him into the wolf pack. Conan looked at him as if he didn't know what was going on. Disco and Chavo Jr. lost to Ray and Horace Hogan when Disco was stuff pile-driven in 428. Nash did an interview and got booed a lot, saying the Goldberg vs. Bigelow match that had been hyped the entire show would be a three-way dance because he was joining in. Glacier beat Saturn via DQ in 332 when Miller kicked Glacier when Saturn moved and Scott Dickinson called for the DQ and raised Glacier's hand. Saturn gave Dickinson a DVD. Match was worse than you'd think. One who came out with a neck brace on. Luger beat Emery Hale in 406 with a rack. Hale looks to be about 6 foot 6, 295 and worked real hard and has way more charisma than the average rookie good size. Not a great physique but not fat either. He's got a ton of potential although he's a long way right now from being ready. He was so excited out there on Nitro that he stiffed Luger and bloodied his mouth. If he works for three months, he'll probably be better than Luger. Jericho pinned Duncan with a Toyota roll using the ropes as leverage in 517. Duncan did a big dive over the top. Another good match between the two. Giant choke slammed Scott Putski in 28 seconds. Malenko and Benoit vs. Raven and Canyon never took place. Raven was backstage trying to set himself up for programs with DDP and Piper and refused to come out. Canyon came out and mouthed off to Anderson who pulled out a tire iron and he ran away after taking a few stiff chops and boots from both guys. Flair did an interview which was the only real good thing on the entire show. Flair got a big pop when he mentioned the name Paul Bosch, which is amazing since Bosch died nearly 10 years ago. He got bleeped a lot. Actually this was a super interview. They showed the Conan video again. The video is great but I can't believe they showed it in the third hour. They had a lot of new cuts in it. Conan beat T via DQ when Ray hit Conan in the shoulder with a slapjack in 511. Ray and T argued after. Finish was very poorly done and a bad idea to begin with considering what they were ending the show with. Conan was actually cheered a lot more than T, who is from Houston. Shiner vs. Hall never started as band were attacked Hall. Luger and Conan made the save but they didn't do so well either, and then Giant showed up. Page cleaned house for the save. Originally Nash was booked into this angle but smartly he didn't want to be used as a setup for Page to get heat. Shuvani did a retort to Ross comments last week about Goldberg being an Austin wannabe saying you wrestling fans and you other wrestling announcers know Goldberg is the toughest man in our sport. WCW should have retorted, but this was pathetic. When Ross knocked Goldberg, whether it was a cheap shot or just business or however you view it, at least every viewer watching had a clear idea of what he said and the point he was trying to make. In typical WCW announcer fashion, they address something with these vague references that almost no viewers watching have any idea what they are talking about. Hart came out for an interview. With no program to talk about, he mainly talked about his cat being happy to see him. He was becoming target practice and told Gene Okerlund that those cups are being aimed at Gene. It was a crack up. The show ended with Goldberg, Nash and Bigelow brawling for 40 seconds before security ran in and did the pull apart, and about 32,000 bottles and cups were thrown at the ring. This was one of the most perplexing three hours of Nitro ever. How can you put on a show this bad when you have this kind of a live gate? Bischoff wasn't at Thunder or Nitro this past week. He wasn't at Nitro because there was a big awards dinner given to Dr. Harvey Schiller. Savage will have new entrance music produced by Jimmy Hart upon his return. The Booker T vs. Enos match on the November 30th Nitro was a late replacement for Giant vs. Disciple. Disciple no-showed and the match was cancelled. Rick Rude was backstage at the November 30th Nitro, but with no Kurt Hennig, there was no purpose in using him and he left before the show started. Hennig's knee is supposedly not recovering well and he is expected to not be making his December bookings. The plan for Sandman appears to be in the role of a best friend of Raven's while growing up and Raven's mother will send him to WCW to try and get Raven out of his depression, so they'll start off as a tag team. Bret Hart and Eric Bischoff were both interviewed on December 1st for an NBC Dateline segment that airs on January 27th. Hart this week also filmed an episode of Mad TV. The NWO referee's name is Mark Johnson. At the December 1st WCW Saturday night tapings, Silver King joined the LWO after losing to Disco Inferno. In a backstage angle, they asked Super Kolo to join, he said no, and they all beat him up. A Japanese wrestler who has been working in Mexico named Taro was first put over Kendall Wyndham, 
then they taped another match where Wyndham went over him because he looked so terrible the first time out. After all these years, Chip Minton got his TV break beating Chris Adams and doing an interview. Minton, who was on the U.S. bobsled racing team in the 1994 and 1998 Olympics, placing fourth in 1998 in Nagano, has been training for wrestling for years but doesn't show much. Stevie Ray refused to do a job for Conan on the World War III pay-per-view show. Giant has dropped from 505 down to 470. Stevie Ray has also dropped weight. The WCW Saturday Night main event this coming week is Hall over Ray in a match where the winner was to get a shot at heart at Starcade. At the November 30th Nitro, Bischoff wanted Jericho to sign his new deal on the spot. When Jericho didn't, Bischoff ordered the TV belt taken from him. Jericho was given a win on the December 7th show because they are building him for a TV title shot on December 27th, and because they've already given up on Duncombe as being marketable. It appears that the Steiners each signed for $600,000 per year for three years. Our reports of Sting signing a five-year deal at $1 million per were incorrect. It was actually a four-year deal at significantly more than that figure, maybe along the lines of $6.5 million over the four years. In actuality, after Hogan, Austin, and Hart, Sting will probably be the next highest paid wrestler in the business. Bischoff and McMahon were both on CNN's Moneyline with Bill Dobbs on November 30th. According to the story, NBC is negotiating to bring wrestling back to network television. Thunder on December 3rd in Memphis drew a sellout 8,358 paying $144,080. The show drew a healthy 3.69 rating and 5.82 share on the live show and a 1.1 rating and 4.2 share on the replay. Eddie Guerrero vs. Ciclope ended in 241 with no finish as Guerrero had him beat and called out the LWO and they offered Ciclope a t-shirt. With these matches that simply have the bell sound, or even no bell sounding and everything just stops wrestling, it was like watching bad WWF. Giant beat Renegade with a choke slam off the middle ropes in one minutes. After the match, Page knocked Giant out of the ring with a chair and Giant backed up from him. Chavo Jr. beat Mike Enos in 451 with a Toyota roll. Enos pounded on him after the match. Enos may be the most underrated wrestler in the business. He's a real good worker, but lacks charisma badly. Expect he and Norman Smiley to get minor pushes. Mysterio Jr. beat Viano 5 with a springboard head scissors in a 440. With Mike Tenney not out there, Tony Schiavone and Lee Marshall didn't know if it was 5455. As if the Roman numeral on the trunks isn't a dead giveaway, how about the idea that right before their eyes, poor 5. 4 was carted out and just had neck surgery. Granted, there are a lot of things to remember when doing a broadcast, but somehow you'd think that fact would be something the announcers would know. Wrath pinned Minton in 358 with a meltdown. Were these guys on different pages of what? Minton looked real bad. Most guys I've seen on local indies with six months of training and no athletic background are better workers than Minton. Benoit and Malenko beat Raven and Canyon via count out in 909. Canyon worked the entire match with Raven pouting in the corner refusing tags. Canyon finally tagged him and Raven just walked out. Better than average match with a lame finish. Conan beat Disco in 521 with the Tequila Sunrise. Better than average. Finally Scott Steiner beat Hall with the Steiner Recliner in 720. Despite it being the main event, crowd was dead. NWO ref did the slow counts with after Hall hit a bulldog off the top. Hall finally gave the ref the edge but Steiner beat him up. For the December 10th show they had dunk him over Jericho when Jericho got the pin using the ropes but Conan told the ref, who restarted the match and dunk him won. Saturn beat Glacier via DQ when Wanu interfered. Saturn gave Wanu the DVD after the match. Smiley beat Hayashi with the chicken wing. Mysterio Jr. beat Guerrera in a match to determine who got the cruiserweight title shot when the LWO interfered and Kidman made the save. During the post-match brawl a huge fan got past security and was about to blindside Guerrero but he tripped over the ropes. Guerrero kicked him in the face as hard as he could, leaving a footprint on his head and the rest of the Mexicans swarmed him and he was taken away. This probably will be edited off TV. Said to be in the three stars range. Lodi beat Booker T via DQ and Stevie Ray hit Lodi with a slapjack. The two argued after the match since Ray cost his brother an easy win. Benoit beat Canyon via DQ and Raven hit Benoit with a spray can. Luger and Conan won a two-on-three over Horace Hogan and Ray and Vincent, when Hall helped out. In a dark match, Page beat Giant via DQ and Giant choke slammed the ref. Out of seven TV matches on December 10th, six ended due to outside interference and four were DQs.
The reason the TV main was 2 on 3 is it was originally booked as Wolfpack vs Bando but Nash refused to do the match not wanting to be in a match that on paper would be bad while he needed to build his momentum for Starcade. And they put Hall in the match, but he refused because he didn't think it was right for the storyline to team with the Wolfpack, but agreed to do a run-in at the end, which probably did make more sense. WCW has added a house show on February 26th at the Alamo Dome in San Antonio. House shows this week saw December 2nd in Nashville drew 5,078 paying $85,133, December 4th in Tupelo, Mississippi drew 3,424 paying $71,530, December 5th in Little Rock drew 7,419 paying $140,160, and December 6th in Shreveport drew 6,067 paying $116,063. Most of those cities were down about 25% from WCW's last time in. Merchandise for the week was $454,582 or $7.35 per head. Tupelo show was a mess as they were stalling for Giant to be released from prison. They had Silver King and Lismark Jr. vs. Cyclope and Damien go 20 minutes, then Prince Aokia vs. Lodi go an interminable 20 minutes and then do a 30 minutes intermission. Because there were so many no-shows already, Raven, Saturn, Alex Wright, Disco, they wound up having Cyclope come out again without his mask as Elvis Gonzalez. Elvis is from Tupelo of course, and job for Chris Adams. They didn't get Giant out in time to do the angle in the Luger Wrath match to set up the tag, so Giant and Nash had to do a main event single with Nash winning. In Little Rock, Silver King and Lismark Jr. vs. Damien and Cyclope was reported as being one of the best matches of the year in the promotion. Rest of card wasn't much. Both Little Rock and Shreveport saw Luger vs. Wrath become Luger and Nash beating Wrath and Giant when Luger racked Wrath. WCW Saturday night on November 28th drew a 2.9 rating, its best in several years, while December 5th was back to a more normal 2.2. The 2.9 was probably because it was the first WCW TV show since Hogan announced his retirement on The Leno Show. At press time, Nitro December 14th in Tampa was 630 shy of capacity, Thunder December 17th in Charlotte was virtually sold out, Starcade at MCI Center was two dozen shy of sold out with 15,161 paying $536,665. Nitro December 28th in Baltimore was virtually sold out. The Nassau Coliseum house show at press time was at 9,082 tickets for $315,956 while the Madison Square Garden show two days earlier had sold 14,662 tickets for $408,829, which is 2,000 shy of capacity. WWF Just days before the Rock Bottom pay-per-view show, there is no finalized card other than Austin vs. Undertaker Buried Alive, Rock vs. Mankind for the title and Goldust vs. Jarrett with Goldust or Deborah McMichael stripping in the middle of the ring depending upon who lost. It's a virtual certainty there will be a tag title match with Outlaws vs. Shamrock and Bossman. The eight-man gimmick match with Oddities and Luna vs. ICP and Headbangers will be changed somewhat since ICP quit the promotion. They were mad about their role and apparently put up a big fuss about having to take the stunner from Austin on TV. Nobody was exactly sorry to see them go although they did get a TV commercial for their CD on Heat once before they left. It may wind up with Oddities and Luna vs. Bangers and Sing and Babu but that isn't a certainty either. The latest estimates for the Survivor Series pay-per-view are a whopping 1.45 buy rate, which would be a $6.44 million company gross, a figure that will trail SummerSlam just slightly. That more than doubled what WCW drew one week later for World War III. In 1997, the top five grossing pay-per-view shows were all WCW. In 1998 WWF will have three of the top four, the only domestic show of the past week was the Raw tapings on December 1st in New Haven which drew a sellout 7,154 paying $150,511 and $49,450 in merchandise or $6.91 per head. It is expected that every show in December will wind up being sold out. Besides MSG being about 2,000 out with nearly three weeks to go and Christmas being one of the two best weekends traditionally for late business, Chicago on December 26th was at 14,799 tickets and $320,115 which is almost guaranteed as an eventual sellout. The Raw in Tacoma is already sold out at 16,639 paying $387,470 and the Raw in Spokane is close enough.
The advance for the February 8 Toronto Sky Dome Raw that is already being heavily pushed as an attempt to draw 30 to 40,000 fans is at 16,394 paying $590,265. The MSG and Chicago shows have been changed again as Austin vs. Boss Man with Austin winning and getting 5 minutes with McMahon, a big ticket seller, has been totally dropped and replaced in MSG with a street fight with Austin and Kane vs. Undertaker and Boss Man and Rock vs. Triple H for the title while Chicago will have Undertaker and Rock vs. Austin and Kane. The January house shows will either have four ways with Austin, Kane, Undertaker and Rock continuing the same house show pattern, except in cities where they've already done four ways, in which they'll do mostly tag matches with those four, plus DX vs. Corporation matches and Shamrock vs. Triple H IC title matches and Goldust vs. Jarrett matches. Jim Ross got the word while in England on December 5th that his mother had passed away from a heart attack, She had been sick most of this past year and several weeks back was in rough shape. Ross actually stayed in England and did the show, but on the day of the show began suffering from Bell's palsy and severe headaches while doing the show. By the next day, the right side of his face was paralyzed. He had the disease four years ago and has paralyzed temporarily the left side of his face, and it took a long time before he regained most of his facial control, which is why he didn't do Raw and won't be on the pay-per-view or the Raw tapings this week either. It was a shoot when Ross would on Raw refer to his mother watching when the show got risque or his language got a little on the raunchy side. There is no prognosis as to when he'll be back on the air. Michael Cole did Raw with Jerry Lawler and the difference was more noticeable than you'd imagine. Cole tried, but the level of expectation of what the Raw announcer should be doing created by Ross is way out of his league, and to make matters worse, he started losing his voice midway through the live commentary session and was having a hard time talking in the second hour. On the show, they acted as if Goldust and Deborah McMichael were both naked under their trench coats and shot the exposing from the side leaving everything to viewers' imagination. Lawler went off on a subject having to do with gravitational pull of the earth and lack thereof when Deborah exposed herself. The Blackman vs. Singh match was interesting only because there was heat among the boys because Singh doesn't sell enough and a lot of people don't like his attitude. Basically Blackman, who is one of the tougher men in the company, was in there to give Singh an attitude adjustment so he was laying everything in very stiff and making Singh sell. They're trying to push the new China as a sex symbol but she now looks more like a nightclub female impersonator and god knows I see a lot of them around these parts these days. X-Pac and Triple H vs Shamrock and Boss Man was a good match, but how can you have an outside interference DQ and a no DQ match? They had Steve Williams and Kurt Angle train together and wrestle each other a lot at the last camp. It appears that they are targeting March or April to start Angle off, with a big push, possibly as a heel. It's interesting to note that when ECW did its clumsy crucifixion Angle, Angle was furious due to his religious beliefs and basically through such a fit Raven had to apologize for the Angle in the ring and Angle never came. Back, Glenn Kolka, who has been out for a long time with a bad knee, suffered a broken thumb training for his return. Steve Bradley was at the last camp and looked good enough that he was signed to a developmental deal is said Bradley got the best match out of Giants Silva that Silva has ever had. Among some of the extras used at the recent tapings, when Steve Austin was in the hallway with a shovel looking for Undertaker, the woman he walked by and had a brief conversation with was Stephanie McMahon, Vince's daughter. The guys in the bar harassing China were Don Bucci, the guy she decked, who was indie worker Donnie B, actually younger brother of Supernova, Danny Germando, Inferno Kid, and Anthony Cramasta, Twiggy Ramirez, the orderlies were mainly Jim Ketnerick or wrestlers. The fan with the magazine centerfold of China that Henry took was Kenny Ian Fonte, J.R. Ryder. The plant who got the hose was an indie wrestler named Bulldog Blansky, whose name may be Bob Blansky and he's an assistant high school wrestling coach near New Haven. Headhunters may be brought in as heels for the Latino show. FMW has opened talks to try and get talent for a pay-per-view show in May and a proposed Yokohama Arena date in August. Terry Pock, Terry Power hasn't been on TV although she's been at the tapings. She's had more surgery done and because they hadn't started writing the storyline that involves her and Sable. A February 17th house show date in Knoxville is already sold out. Al Snow suffered a pulled hamstring in England. Austin appeared as a presenter on December 7th at the Billboard Magazine Awards. Marty Garner has been talked with about coming in as a gay manager for too much after they get married. The ceremony is scheduled for TV or pay-per-view. Wonder if Lawler will give the bride away. Catching up on TV ratings, Live Wire on November 28th did a record 2.1, Superstars on November 29th did a 1.6 and Heat on November 29th did a record 4.52, and Pac Blue got a 3.0 as a follow-up. For December 5th to 6th it was Live Wire at 1.8, 
superstars at 1.6 and heat at 4.08. The name Acolytes for Bradshaw and Farouk is an assistant to a high priest. The Acolyte name was picked by Jackal as a rib on the office for his previous portrayal as a religious fanatic cult leader. If you look at the Austin embalming angle again, like anyone would want to, you notice that the hearse had Ohio license plates and the funeral home had an Ohio state flag even though this was all supposed to be taking place in San Jose. The medical center was taped in Bexley, Ohio, a suburb of Columbus. Dan Rodericks in the Baltimore Sun ran a column on attending the raw tapings in Baltimore a few weeks back. He noted that when the oddities came out the WWF actually ignited a device that emitted a sewage-like stench only noticeable to ringsiders to make it as if the oddities don't bathe. What was interesting about the column is it was one of the first mainstream columns that didn't care about real versus fake as opposed to entertainment, and in doing so recognized both good and bad entertainment. He wrote, there are moments of absolutely spectacular athleticism the best example of this Monday night was the match of Max Mini and El Torito, diminutive Mexicans who flipped and flew across the ring like aerialists with attitudes and moments of lame shtick. Monday's latter match, Mankind vs. Bossman, was a yawn with rungs. The Las Vegas newspaper had an article about timeshare holders at the former Debbie Reynolds Hotel being upset about the changes in clientele the WWF will bring. They also complained the WWF wasn't letting them know anything about its plans, which the WWF responded to by saying it was because they really hadn't worked out the plans. Butterbean was on TSN's Off the Record and talked of a potential match with Bart Gunn. WWF has talked about doing brawl for all rules shoot matches with Gunn against Butterbean or against some name UFC fighters although it isn't high on the priority list and nothing has been finalized. McMahon apparently wanted Rock to actually bend over and kiss his ass on the November 16th TV show but Rock refused to do it. The Reader's Pages Awards Steve Austin may get huge pops by just flipping off Vince McMahon and WCW crowds may constantly chant Goldberg, and sometimes it's piped in. But true charisma is when crowds chant the name of a wrestler who hasn't been around for months. When people scream the wrestler's phrase anytime anyone in the business delivers his move. On September 14th, this wrestler received the greatest crowd reaction ever given to a pro wrestler, to Ric Flair. With so many poor taste angles this year, how can you narrow a choice down to one? I originally chose Larry Zbyszko's crude comments about Louis Piccoli the day after his death, but since that time, WCW actually tried to grab ratings with Scott Hall's problems. That was sickening. I was relieved when Dustin Runnels dropped his last Goldust character, but his born-again gimmick set a new low. I'm a Christian and this really offended me, especially in the Sodom and Gomorrah of the WWF. Next year you should introduce a new category for Best Angle, with the storylines often overshadowing the wrestling this year there was a lot of great choices. Two words. Jason Sensation. Regarding the embalming sketch. Mixing the occult with the company's top star doesn't translate well. Remember the ultimate warrior Papa Shango angle, and what happened from it? See Preston Powers. Midway, Tennessee. Shamrock. Frank Shamrock's achievements in UFC are in no way comparable to those of Hoist Gracie, Dan Severn, Don Fry, or Mark Coleman. They all won multiple tournaments under full Valley Tudo rules. Frank Shamrock, just like his brother Ken, had a championship created for him and has fought under what basically amounts to pancreas rules with punching to the face allowed. The UFC discriminates against Brazilian jiu-jitsu stylists because they aren't allowed to play the waiting game. It discriminates against wrestlers because they are limited in striking on the ground. Under full NHB rules, I'm 100% certain many of the recent UFC fights would have resulted in different winners. Ironic that a tournament shunned by the martial arts community because it exposed most disciplines as frauds now not only labels itself mixed martial arts in a desperate bid to claim acceptance by them, but also goes against the original ethos of the competition itself. Also, I couldn't believe your criticism of Pride 4. It was the best MMA card of the year and showcased some of the best fighters on the planet as opposed to the manufactured martial artists in the UFC. Alan Goes vs. Kazushi Sakuraba was one of the best if not the best technical fight I've ever seen and I've been following the sport since 1993. Alexander Otsuka's win over Marco Ruiz was the biggest upset in the history of the sport. When was the last time a genuine Brazilian legend quit? Mark Kerr vs. Hugo Duarte highlighted the need for a cage in pride and once again showed by Kerr is the best heavyweight fighter on the planet. Hicks and Gracie vs. Nobuiko Takata also cruelly exposed Gracie's ability. My only criticism of Pride 4 was the overzealous refereeing in the first two matches. Armetti. Middlesbrough, England. Response from Dave Meltzer, while Frank Shamrock never won any eight-man tournaments like those names you mentioned, 
nor was he ever invited into one, his current eight-match winning streak over the past 13 months was far more impressive than anything any of the aforementioned names did because he did so against competition that was far superior to the level of competition all the aforementioned names were going against in their tournaments. Gracie's biggest wins was over Ken Shamrock, a very tough man who up until that point in time had largely been a pro wrestler who did some primitive tough man contests and had good submission knowledge but had never fought a man in a gi before, and Dan Severn, who was strictly a wrestler, and a very good wrestler, but strictly a wrestler with no cross training up to that point whatsoever, and a powerful but totally inexperienced chemo, who overpowered and injured Hoyce until blowing up in three minutes. This isn't knocking Hoyce as a great fighter, because he is a great fighter and still had to beat everyone put in his path. In the second meeting with Ken Shamrock, Shamrock would have easily won the decision. If you look at Gracie, Severn, Fry and Coleman's foes they had beaten and what their foes skill level was in winning those tournaments and what the people they beat to win those tournaments had done elsewhere since and compare them with Shamrock's opponents like Inoue, Henderson, Kosaka, Jackson and Zinoviev and what they've accomplished elsewhere in real competition. There's no comparison. You never know but I doubt if any of the names mentioned if put in a row against the same eight fighters would have beaten all eight and Shamrock would be hard pressed to do it again. Anytime you change the rules of fighting you are going to change some of the winners and losers, but you can't use the rule changes to criticize the people who won under those rules. The current rules have changed the sport to be far more exciting, and the level of competition is far stiffer than in its embryonic period where Gracie took advantage of the fact that nobody else had fought real fights under those rules and his family had for 60 years and were way ahead of the curve. The time limits and judging penalizes passivity and that does discriminate against BJJ in the same way that not having an unlimited time limit for basketball or football games essentially penalizes a better conditioned but less skilled team. There are no sports, combat or otherwise that have no time limit or some sort of scoring system, whether it be wrestling, boxing, judo, kickboxing, karate or whatever there are decisions when there isn't a finishing move put on before the time limit expires. Wrestlers are penalized in the current UFC by banning headbutts, which in some cases with an effective combat against the BJJ guys resting in the guard, but that's the reality of the political situation and if you criticize UFC for pretty much any of their rule changes, you're being unrealistic to the political situation of the sport. All the Japanese events also ban headbutts. Pride even bans elbows on the ground, which are legal in UFC except to the base of the spine. Personally, I hate the gloves rule and accept the shoes rules, but I realize in a real fight, whatever that means, competitors don't wear gloves, and they don't go into the fight barefooted, but politically you'll never be able to put on a sport where people kick to the face in street shoes because that's way too violent for me, and you can't in Brazil or Japan either for all the talk about true NHB because the reality is it just doesn't, and can't exist. God knows all the trouble UFC went through because in the beginning the fighters didn't wear gloves, and most of that was due to ignorance. The only significant difference between the UFC rules and the pride rules are that UFC orders stand-ups when the action gets dull and awards decisions at the end of the time limit. Thus pride allows guys to lay on their back and matches to come to a complete halt because of it and encourages a man who feels he's losing to stall and escape with a draw. Pride has yet to have one entertaining show because largely of that rule difference, because of them fighting in a ring inside of an octagon, and because of an overall poor job of matchmaking. The Goes vs. Sakuraba match, which went 30 minutes without a decision, saw more than half of that time spent with Goes laying on his back and Sakuraba standing there not knowing what to do to counter. While it was a unique tactical fight between very skilled competitors, I find it laughable to be called the best technical fight in history. The maybe 10 minutes that they were engaged in grappling was very good technically. The problem with Kerr Duarte was partially not having it in a cage. But the other problem was again the pride rules that allow someone to lay on his back and in the case of Duarte, he was laying on his back to avoid fighting and just hopeful, without judges, to stall things out for a draw. If anything, Pride was the show with the manufactured martial artists, as what else could people like Takata, Sano, Ismail and Duarte, and to an extent Hicks and Gracie and even Ruiz be called as all had reputations largely the product of manufacturing, and not from anything they had proven in fights against real top-class fighters even though all are either Brazilian legends or Japanese pro-wrestling legends. I don't blame Pride for using Takata and those who criticize the Gracie vs Takata fights for taking place don't understand business. Without Takata, there would be no company in the first place. But if there is anyone that could be called manufactured, it's he, to the point Pride had to put on a worked main event on its previous show to give Takata a win to set up the Gracie rematch. As far as UFC creating titles for the Shamrocks, 
UFC created the first Superfight title because it wanted to market individual championship matches to be able to sell specific matches as opposed to just the generic tournament on pay-per-view and because Hoist didn't want to fight tournaments anymore. The title was created for Hoist, but after Hoist's match with Ken, he dropped out, Ken stayed, and then beat Severn, who was favored by most of the time to beat Ken, to become the first heavyweight singles champion. The middleweight division was created for Kevin Jackson to be the star of and because there were so many talented fighters at about 185 to 200 pounds that would have a hard time being marketed in an all-heavyweight show which UFC had been up to that point. In fact, UFC did not have a high opinion of Frank initially as a NHB fighter stemming from David Isaacs seeing his loss to John LeBay, was that he was a good-looking guy with a great name because of his brother who they could use at some point as an impressive-looking win for someone they wanted to push, with their original idea being Tank Abbott. UFC put Ensign Inoue, not Shamrock, on their posters and print ads for the Japan show. The winner of their match was to face Jackson on the Japan show, although I'm told Semaphore Entertainment Group did expect Frank to win that fight. While it was acknowledged after he beat Inoue, that Frank had a chance to beat Jackson, to Semaphore Entertainment Group, the expectations going in was that Jackson would win. Once he won the match in 14 seconds, only then did Semaphore Entertainment Group attempt to market him as a star. Women's Champions when Sable won the WWF women's title at Survivor Series, she became the 10th woman to hold the belt since around the mid-50s thanks to an incredibly long title reign by the fabulous Moolah. Technically there have been more than 10, as women like Velvet McIntyre briefly held the belt but I'm talking about title changes that were actually acknowledged. So I've decided to rank the champs in order. 1. Bull Nakano. A tremendous all-around talent. A great heel who never really got to show her true stuff in the WWF. If anyone disputes Bull being ranked number one, let's just say that none of the other ladies have ever done a leg drop off the top of a steel cage or a somersault leg drop. 2. Fabulous Moolah. She would have to be ranked near the top of most lists. Although she was slow in later years, she was a great talent in that she knew what to do in order to annoy a crowd. When she entered the ring at MSG once, she planed a big kiss on Bobby Heenan and the look of disdain she gave the crowd was great. 3. Jacqueline. She really moved up on my list after I saw her match with Starla Saxton on Heat. She did some great moves in that bout and showed that she is limited when she works with Sable. 4. Alundra Blaze. Not liked by all, but I have to say that I never saw her in a horrible match. She and Bull often had the best match on a card. She even got a few very good matches out of Bertha Fay. Her Asia Kong mini matches were always rushed. While in the WWF she had the advantage of working with above average workers. 5. Leilani Kai. Anyone who doubts her talent should watch a tape of any Glamour Girls vs. Jumping Bomb Angels matches. I saw a tape of the JB Angels from Japan and their match was nothing special, which told me that the Glamour Girls brought out the best in them. 6. Bertha Fay. Okay. Some of her WWF stuff stunk. But it was mostly due to her silly gimmick. In her early days, she could put on a violent ECW-style match. 7. Sensational Sherry. I was never big on her. It's unfortunate she went down the valet route. She never really had an interesting opponent in the WWF, so this probably hurts her ranking. 8. Wendy Richter. A big 80 star, yet she never put on an impressive match. Most of her matches saw her get destroyed the whole match and then do a reversal and winning. 9. Sable. She could move up the list in the future, but her short and limited matches put her near the bottom for now. 10. Rock and Robin. Her brother Jake Roberts should teach her a thing or two about how to get a crowd into the match. Just a colorless wrestler. Ken Raftery. Staten Island, New York. Response from Dave Meltzer, I definitely rate Kai a lot higher on the list. She had the disadvantage of being a large woman who wasn't particularly good looking in a time period where body and looks were more important than ability, and unlike Nakano, she didn't have much of a gimmick. But for pure work, she put the rest of the women besides Nakano on the list to shame. Tributes. I got a copy of Tributes and it was worth every penny. Every obituary was fascinating to read from Bruiser Brody to Art Barr to Kerry Von Eric, Andre the Giant, Eddie Gilbert, etc. I was still much of a mark when I found out about Von Eric's suicide. He was one of my favorite wrestlers in the WWF and I had no idea just how screwed up his life was, not to mention the rest of his family. Some questions I've wondered about. Why did Lex Luger leave WCW to join the WBF? and then joined WWF in January 1993? Didn't he also suffer his motorcycle accident during this time? Why did Vince McMahon try and shove the WBF down our throats so much? How many of his bodybuilders were on steroids? Brian Westcott. Meridian, Idaho. 
response from Dave Meltzer. Luger joining the WBF was for all intent a front. Luger was under contract to WCW and at the time their world champion. I know that makes no sense now, and it really didn't then either. But you know. McMahon wanted to sign the rival group's world champion but Luger had a long-term contract. McMahon came up with a deal where he'd sign Luger to a huge money contract to be a bodybuilder so it theoretically had nothing to do with the WWF or competition with WCW. Of course the long term was when his WCW term expired, he'd switch over to the WWF. McMahon was basically offering him the same or more money, I don't recall the figures right now, to train, stay home, not take bumps or wrestle for one year as he was making his world champion doing all the traveling at his current job. It was an easy decision. So Kip Frey, who was running WCW at the time, let Luger out of his contract to become a pro bodybuilder. Of course Luger showed up on WWF TV right away, and Frey threatened legal action, so McMahon pulled him from WWF TV and concentrated on getting him over on McMahon's weekly bodybuilding show on USA that did terrible ratings. Luger was never going to compete as a bodybuilder, but was going to guest pose on McMahon's attempt at a bodybuilding pay-per-view show which flopped miserably. However, a week or two before that show, he suffered the motorcycle wreck. McMahon, because he was into bodybuilding and was also a pro wrestling fan, felt that he could sell that to people like himself. It just didn't fly. In early 1992 amidst a ton of media pressure stemming from the Zarian trial and pro wrestling, McMahon gave his bodybuilders their first drug test, which caused Lou Ferrigno to quit basically on the spot. Ferrigno claimed publicly he was backing out because he needed surgery for carpal tunnel syndrome. The bodybuilders were pissed, as even though it was in their contracts that they could be drug tested, all felt they had been promised there would be no drug testing. At the time the IFBB, the existing major group, had attempted to drug test at the Mr. Olympia the year before and the results in smaller physiques were such that the decision was made to drop it but at the time there were people who joined WBF both because the money offered was considerably higher than what they were used to earning and because they didn't think they'd be hassled over the drug issue. I believe 10 out of 13 failed and legitimately were suspended for a six-week period, which coincidentally ended just before the pay-per-view so none missed the event, a fact that was kept hush-hush at the time since McMahon was promoted the event as the first drug-free professional contest at that level. When the show came around, the general consensus within the industry is that most, but not all, the competitors had been off steroids for the weeks leading up to the show. I'd suggest that then, as now, there is no such thing as a world-class bodybuilder who isn't on a whole lot more than just steroids. Steroids may be the safest thing those are on. I didn't even know Jid had died and had even forgot about Brian Pillman, too. I just received a copy of the Tributes book and stayed up until 2 a.m. reading it. I forgot how well you wrote. I've been advising TV and film companies for the past 10 years, so I have been keeping aware of the resurgence of wrestling, like the broadcast and cable piece. It's ironic how you had always wrote how the US business could benefit from the creativity that was coming out of New Japan and similar innovative promotions. Lo and behold, the US business has boomed due to just that, the whole group versus group concept that I scan by in TV every once in a while on Monday nights. The new breed of bookers finally succeeded with a business plan you've been writing about for years. Congratulations on the excellent writing and the increased awareness you've gotten from national media sources like NPR. Dave Davis. Los Angeles, California. Response from Dave Meltzer. Don't credit me with the ideas leading to the resurgence. Eric Bischoff went to Japan and saw the new Japan vs. UWFI feud for himself and wanted to recreate it. WWF just followed Bischoff's lead. The fact I'd been writing about it years earlier had nothing to do with it other than a lot of observer readers knew about it and how to apply it years before the brains in charge knew about it. Hall. I believe WCW is doing to Scott Hall what they did with Brian Pillman in portraying him as uncontrollable. They saw how popular Pillman became and are trying to resurrect Hall's career in the same way. Unfortunately, it will probably work. Unfortunately, it will also probably have the same ultimate result. Richard Fogerland. Rio Rancho, New Mexico. Hamaguchi. I read with interest your story in the October 19th issue about Kyoko Hamaguchi winning the 1998 World Freestyle Championship. There's something in the story that may require clarification. You stated her plan is to turn pro after the 2000 Olympics, ideally with a gold medal in tow. However, women's wrestling wasn't an Olympic sport in 1996. I haven't heard of it being added in 2000 so if that's the case I'm not sure the Olympic chronology as a prelude to her turning pro makes sense, unless she plans to participate in another Olympic sport, like bodybuilding. Robert Rothis. Shady Side, Maryland. Response from Dave Meltzer.
I know there has been movement to get women's wrestling into the Olympics but I'm not sure what stage the movement is in. It was reported in Japan after Hamaguchi won her second Worlds that her plan was to compete in amateur wrestling until the Olympics and turn pro, hopefully with a gold medal. If women's wrestling isn't added, she could switch to judo as a lot of athletes have made that transition although they are very different sports. This is the end of this issue see you next time.